B A M. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Right, you're very welcome along this Monday morning to OTBAM. It's Jerry Gilroy and Owen Sheehan with you all the way through until 10. We'd love to hear from you. If you're a Mayo fan, licking your wounds. If you're a Tyrone fan and you're awake, fair play to you. Uh, 0879-180-180 is the WhatsApp number. Of course, you can always get us on the YouTube comments or you can get us at Off The Ball AM. If you're a Galway Camogie fan, if you're a Cork Camogie fan and you're upset about stuff, then we can be your forum today. Let us help you get through whatever it is that you need to get through. Uh, as ever, OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. Good morning to start with Gillette. Um, oh, and are we going to talk here or are we just going to get straight into the performance rankings because we don't want to give too much away? Well, people know that in the performance rankings we start with the bad performances first. So do we give Tyrone their place at the top of the show here this morning or do we say, nah, let's postpone the Tyrone chat for like 20 minutes time? How how concerned are you about the re-emergence of the Tyrone Ghosts? <laughs> quite, quite. I think that there was a, a lot of hallmarks of the 2000s from Saturday Night's performance, from their season as a whole, really, since they got out of Ulster. The two games that they played really were very 2000s Tyrone, weren't they? And it just doesn't help those Ghosts when it comes to seeing Brian Duhur there on the sideline. And they even listening to... Young Canavan. And Young Canavan. Yeah, certainly. Uh, they, they, there was huge hallmarks of of the 2000s team just a, a really really top quality outfit that I think in fairness this team has automatically got more credit than the team of the 2000s like immediately I find I think over the decade obviously that Tyrone team managed to in your circles to, to, to get more in credit. your circles a lot of us thought that that Tyrone team were astonishing from the get go but anyway go on no I, I just I just think that there is a, an element of this team where it's like there's been an immediate change when it comes to the management to the style of play earlier this year and this sort of arrival is certainly after they, they beat Kerry in the semi-final where there was an, an expectation that they were going to be a great team. I think a lot of people still could have tallied that with also tipping Mayo on, on Saturday but uh, as we'll get to in just a moment it certainly didn't go Mayo's way. Um, did you watch the game in Kerry? I did. I, I drove all the way down from home at Kerry because I couldn't, I couldn't be around Dublin when... Um, when this was going down. Just in case Mayo won. Just in case Mayo won. Okay, that's good to get that on the record. <laughs> and it's okay, now you can actually come out and unleash all of your anti-Mayo feelings. No, now. no, 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 no. Not, not at all. I just... You I can patronise them and... and no, absolutely. Oh, boy, don't worry. There'll be no, there'll be no patronising of We'll of be Mayo back next year for the 72nd. Uh, and but, what... what When... I don't know if you're watching the pub or not, but if... Um, no. Okay, so the... Is there... A, a, like, this is... Could they both lose territory for Kerry supporters, Right. Uh, you know, if the if the ground could swallow up both teams here and there would be no All Ireland champions this year, we'd be happy. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, if that was an option. But it, it, I think it was very much everybody wanted Mayo to win, and I think Kerry were on board with that. Like, I mean, you could tell us better here. You were in the stadium, you were around Jones's Road. I presume Dublin on Saturday was a coronation for Mayo. Uh, Pre match, yeah. I mean, then uh, like that was the type of thing that you would always. Uh, uh, there are ghosts for anybody who's been. A supporter of a team who's been beaten in an All Ireland final, so there was definitely um, afterwards people were talking. To me, that was very like nineteen ninety eight, wasn't it? I was like, do you know what? Yes, it was. <laughs> yes, it was. Uh, the clearly superior team won clearly in a very easy manner in the end, and uh, people didn't see that in advance. The ambush was there all along, hiding in plain sight. Um, so yeah, I like. I'm just. I'm very interested to see how people rate this Tyrone team. You were already looking at the odds for next year. How are they ranked? Must they're, be number one, right? Yeah, you would have thought so. They're ten to one. They're fourth placed for next year. Like that has uh, certainly been the the tone uh, regarding that the last couple of year, a couple of, couple of weeks, I should say, that people feel that Mayo and Tyrone have been unfairly written off, and everybody had crowned. Dublin or Kerry when it came to this year's All Ireland Championship, and people were like, "Ah, you stupid Egypts! You knew you didn't know that these two be- that these were actually the two best teams in the country." But as it turns out, uh, they're still not being rated as the two best teams in the country for next year. In fact, Mayo are being rated ahead of Tyrone in terms of their chances of winning next year. So going back to back for Tyrone has previously been an issue for them. When we get into the conversations over the next little while, I think they'll be absolutely right there. I think there's a number of relevant conversations around Tyrone that don't involve Tyrone, though. I think it comes down to a championship structure as well next year because certainly when you look at it, there are uh, there is a system there that will suit other counties more than the current system does. Not that this suited Tyrone or anything like that. You still have a knockout championship where you have to come through the toughest of the four provinces. It absolutely so, didn't. Yeah. Uh, like, I mean, the, 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 there are a number of fascinating angles when it comes to analysing 2022 already. And, and that's just Tyrone. And then 
of course, there's just the added motivation for all these hungry teams, you know, do, 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 who all these teams want it more next year because Tyrone ha- have their All Ireland already. I think, uh, I mean, we can we can get into that sort of nonsense talk this morning. And that's what we're here for, right? Yeah, and all winter as well. That's the joy of it. It is seven thirty-five this morning. This is OTB AM. It's time for the performance rankings. You know, that wasn't an All-Ireland winning performance. Probably should have won the game based on the second half performance. Is it a step too far to say it was the performance so far of the World Cup? Maybe not. OTBAN's performance rankings with Gillette. I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head. That performance is was just lacked that intensity. So every Monday morning we go through the green, the red and the amber of the sporting weekend. And it was always going to be green or red for the green and red of Mayo uh, this week I, I mean um, it was never going to be Amber I guess was it I thought they were going to win and I thought that if they showed up they had a really good chance of winning and I expected them to show up because they showed up in 2016 they showed up in 2017 maybe last year wasn't an amazing performance but it was still better than the performance they put in on Saturday I felt I thought they were really poor I thought there was this old sense of performance anxiety and a uh, lack of a marquee forward conversation that, that came up once again, the conversations yeah. we were having before Killian O'Connor uh, cemented himself as one of the greatest forwards of his generation. It felt there were echoes of that, but it also felt we had got back to a point where Mayo were underperforming in the final. And I didn't see that coming because I felt that a big part of their mental block involved Dublin and they had got over that hurdle in the semi-final. So I thought they were, there was a bit of the banishing of ghosts already done. And I thought that, 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 that they would have been, they would have played in a, in a free way didn't seem that way on Saturday. I actually think last year's performance was much worse because they conceded a goal after nine seconds or eleven seconds. So, um, I, not to get to, to get bogged down in it, but it is back to back, as you rightly point out, back to back All Ireland final performances where they haven't produced what we think is their best football. Um, all week long, when we were previewing this game, we talked about the relative strength of the bench. Like Colin McShane scores a beautiful goal with his first touch, and Mayo don't get anything off their bench comparatively. Uh, the chaos that Mayo like to bring, um, the the better analysts are like, well, that's all well and good in the middle of a game, but if that's your game plan, then actually it can become counterproductive. Somebody, um, one of the papers has printed a Paul Galvin tweet saying he wouldn't have been able to play half forward in that game because all the backs are running into your space, taking all your space. Uh, you know, where's the opportunity for the half forwards to create? I think we've we've got now the the holy trinity or the full house of self-inflicted wounds by Mayo in an all Ireland final it's the red card when the game is there for them just just maintain your superiority the two own goals in a game where Dublin don't perform in an all Ireland final this thing about the Dubs always were always brilliant on an all Ireland final day they always managed the process they needed two own goals to scrape a draw against the it turns out the best Mayo team of that time and now the missed penalty and everybody's like oh Toronto would have won anyway but I'm not sure Toronto would have won anyway the point that Andy Moore was making the whole week was here are two teams who have not got through this next year if Mayo score a penalty against Tyrone in the All-Ireland final and Tyrone go on to win it we will know that uh, that they would have gone on to win it but this year there was room for someone to put doubt in that Tyrone team's mind there was that moment where Mayo had that opportunity to do it and they couldn't do it and look would Killian O'Connor have nailed the penalty? yeah I think he probably would I think, I think we all think Killian O'Connor would have nailed the penalty and that's just going to be a, a harsh thing for them forever. But uh, I think what happens in matches like this is that uh, teams get born and we, we see something forged. And I think now Toronto are going to be around for the next two or three years and they're going to win tight games that champions win, that, that thing that Andy Moran talked about. And Mayo still haven't got that. All the stuff about that this Mayo team haven't had success at underage level and so therefore they don't have ghosts anymore and they don't have baggage. Now they all have baggage. And, I mean, when they overcome that, it's going to be the most remarkable thing of all time. There are a number of things that they got wrong on Saturday, obviously. The, when it comes to the substitutions and the decisions on the sideline, it did feel that Horn absolutely nailed it in the semi-final and something just didn't go right on Saturday. Obviously, they'll have had more information than we'll have had spectating, but I'm not sure what your view on the Portugal Horror substitution was. Like, that, that for me is... That for me puts him right into the bad this week because that's a sort of self-inflicted wound for me right after he makes this lung busting run up the pitch. The sort of run that kind of disrupts a very well-organised defence. And, and like, I, I, don't, I don't even want to call it a well-organised defence. A well-organised 
collection of defenders is probably a better way of putting it, like top quality defenders who are doing a brilliant man-to-man job in pretty much all their defensive positions. So when you've got a man running towards you and you've got to step off your man a little bit to try and stop this incoming train, that causes doubt, that causes a, a little bit of chaos in that Tyrone defence, which perhaps they wouldn't have liked. And I thought that if you're making that sort of lung-busting effort up the pitch, maybe he knew he was getting taken off and maybe he knew that was the last effort he had. As I say, there, there is more. Inf- we don't have all the information available, but it just seemed like a very unusual substitution. We'll get into Aidan O'Shea a little bit later on as well and of course there's been uh, a lot of people coming to the defence in terms of personal attacks and all that and that is all right and good and of course he handled uh, a good bit of ball in that second quarter of the game but I thought he he just didn't work again on on Saturday in a, in a really big game and I thought that same substitution that, that Horan made maybe not the same personnel wise but taking off Aidan O'Shea in the semi-final I thought that I, th- I thought that was coming. I was like, this is, this is only a matter of time before he makes the exact same change. So I was surprised when that didn't happen and I was surprised when Portugal Horror did get taken off. So I, I think that kind of hammers home a little bit of misery for Mayo. Yeah, so Horror was Mark McCurry, is that? like? Yeah. And certainly that seems to it. And so McCurry played well and scored and yeah. was creating chances. But like, um, that's going to happen. Like, Clifford played well and scored, but that was because somebody is going to be doing the scoring. Like, I don't know, maybe, maybe you're right, maybe there was an injury or something or there was a knock that we didn't see. But certainly, if if you want your uh, chaos and war to be happening, he is a man who's bringing chaos and war. Like, Oshie Mullen is the one who ends up getting caught underneath McShane for the goal. Um, and Oshie Mullen is going to go on to have one of the great Mayo Gaelic football careers. There's no doubt about it, but he looked a little bit lacking in sharpness, as you would do, having had the injury and not been at full tilt for the last while. Um, and I don't. They were obviously weren't going to take him off. But I, look, uh, on on the on the sideline, it definitely seems like what Tyrone had uh, trumped what Mayo had, and that's going to be very hard for James Horn to take, given the progress that this team have made. The other side about Mayo, and look, we're we're talking about them now because we'll talk about Tyrone later on, is that uh, there are some. I mean, you have better access to this information than most people. But the talk around Mayo is that some of those kids that are coming through are really good. They brought off, they brought on a young a young fella. That many players didn't. Many of the rest of the country didn't know. With the Orm, say it again. Orm. Orm. So yeah, I, I, I'm like, I mean, the, the, I, I'd heard in Mayo during the week that this guy was potentially with a shout of starting uh, the game. I, had, I hadn't seen him play against Leitrim earlier in the year. Tommy had. He was saying that. Um, maybe in a couple of years' time, once he fully bulks up, he'll be a good player. But there's like real excitement about him, and I think that's kind of been the trend for this Mayo team over the last two seasons, in particular, where players have been coming out of the blue, and all of a sudden they've arrived and they've been really, really good pretty quickly. And I think Mullen and O'Hara fall into that category actually. That right away that they're, they're not at this point they're like your first two names alongside Lee Keegan and in, in your defensive team sheet. But kind of when they first come along the scene, you're like, who's this guy? And they've come up to speed really quickly. That's the real positive for Mayo. Is that yeah? Like so again to go back to I think with Conor McKeown on the papers a couple of weeks ago talking about when Mayo get annihilated by the Dubs in was it Northern Ireland semi final or was it a, was it a semi final nineteen yeah and if you were to say at that point that Mayo would be in an All Ireland final uh, with a chance of winning it quickly everybody would have said you're doting because that team yeah. is finished and it's finished for the long f- and actually what they've done <laughs> is they've rebuilt so. You know, again, you look at the age profile of the teams, Tyrone are more advanced. They've got more around that 25, 27, 29, 30 than, uh, than Mayo do. And so maybe seasoned by another 18 months, maybe next year isn't the year, and it's the year after that this Mayo team actually reaches its full expression. But by that point, Kevin McLaughlin, you know, maybe he's gone in two years' time. Uh, is Lee Keegan coming back next year? I don't know. I really hope he does because mm. his performance was absolutely sensational in terms of being somebody like I don't want I don't want this to be a pile on a mayo right because it's it's very easy in the aftermath of that to say ah there you go stereotypical but every time something really bad happened they came back and scored a point like like a Lee Keegan point the two goals they came back and scored the next point immediately afterwards yeah. it was like what is undead can never be killed what is whatever that line was uh, <laughs> Um, and I, like the, their zombie quality is actually something to be celebrated and admired and at the same time oof, this is going to be the heartbreaking defeat that is very hard for them to come back from and 
I, I, I kind of go along with that idea as well that there might actually be brighter days pretty soon as well because if they manage to get this far with this generation that's coming up not actually fully formed yet, then what can they possibly do next? Of course, I, I think that the championship might get a little bit more, get even more competitive over the next couple of seasons. So it might be difficult for them to get to that level. But I, like it's in the context of Saturday, this is obviously desperately disappointing for Mayo. They were favourites for an All-Ireland final. They underperformed on the day. But this wasn't some sort of last chance for them. Of course, as you point out, this the, the problem for me now is that this adds a layer of baggage for the first time ever to, for a lot of these players. Because for me, they looked a, a little bit carefree in the semi-final in a brilliant way, in an absolutely brilliant way. And now this adds that little layer of, hmm, we've, we've been here in a final that we were expected to win and we just didn't show up. But you're right about what you say about Tyrone as well. Like Enda McGinley made the point on the show yesterday that actually this Tyrone team is more experienced than the Mayo team. Yes, if you look at County Mayo versus County Tyrone, of course the County of Mayo has more baggage than the County of Tyrone. But not these players, pre-match, not these players. These players are younger than the Tyrone players. These Tyrone players, in fact, have played in the 2018 final, uh, a lot of them, and, and have been desperately disappointed from that, and they, they've managed to come back. So there, there is a difference here, and of course this is all, I guess, revisionism after the fact, but... Maybe we should have seen this coming a little clearer. I, I know, in fairness, the, the prevailing analysis before the game was this is a 50-50 game. I don't think anybody was really saying that Mayo were definitely going to win this. People just had a hunch that Mayo were going to win this. But maybe if we dug down a little bit deeper, the, the experience that Tyrone has and uh, the age profile that they have and the bench that they have, I guess those are the sort of things that definitely get you over the line in a, in a tight game. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I was predicting on this show that Tyrone were going to win. And just to, I want to put that on the record here. You were like, oh, no, 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 I think it's going to be Mayo. And then I kind of, um, I wavered a bit at the last minute and went for the draw on Friday night show, which I shouldn't have done. I was just, I got... Well, I got why did you waver? What, what, what changed your mind? swept away by the conspiracy theories. Well, because I wanted, I wanted to manifest it into, I wanted us all as a country to manifest another week of this. Wouldn't that have been great? Wouldn't another week of us talking nonsense about Mayo against Tyrone, except with... 97 minutes of evidence have been fairly sensational. Yeah, no, it would have been absolutely. I, and I like I, it felt a little bit disappointing that we didn't get the grandstand finish. It does. It does. Uh, what I what I do think about this is that if uh, if these two teams played a best of seven or a best of nine, it would be a smashing victory for Tyrone over that series at the moment. That these two teams are actually that there's significant daylight between them, and that that's evident now as it wasn't. Pre-game, and I think like mm. I think that those final twenty minutes are are when that Tyrone team are in many ways post the penalty, and I, I do actually think that the penalty is a huge moment because it gives Tyrone the sense that well no, <laughs> well no, this is right there for us, and also the quality of their bench becomes so much more evident at that stage. Uh, I'd love to see them gone behind just to see what they're like when they go behind. It, it, like in, in the business end of the game, obviously. Yeah, because they were, you know, obviously two points down. Is it the first team since 2004, 2005 to um, concede the first two scores and to go on and win the game? So oh, all the signs were there for Mayo. Mm. Yeah, they, they certainly were. But I, I kind of agree with you on that as well, that there, there was a bit of a gap between them at the end. And I, like I, I, just, I couldn't really identify that beforehand. Uh, look... Uh, Malachi Clerkin's piece uh, the the subheading is Hora needs to find a role for O'Shea and end his torment once and for all the role is full forward with Killian O'Connor playing off him isn't it and and Tommy Gold's playing off him so you've got a three man full forward line and like I, I think Killian O'Connor's absence is so important because he's got that hard tackling edge that kind of yeah. plays on the edge sets the tone he's the one and they didn't really have that in the full forward line. They have a lot of nice forwards who are young and are coming into themselves. And up against Tyrone, there's nothing nice about those Tyrone lads. <laughs> like, they've come up uh, iron sharpens iron in the club game in Tyrone, and they know exactly how they're supposed to tackle, and they know exactly how to deal with that. So, um, yeah, like, I, um, the, the, there's, there's something there. Like, I, I do think players like, like Conroy have got that edge this season and like the amount of work he kind of went through in the middle third the other day and definitely in the semi-final against Dublin you're kind of like alright this guy's got that hard tackling element that you need to be a full forward player for, for Mayo because that was the whole thing about their run to the final last year was the, all the turnovers Killeen O'Connor and Aidan O'Shea were involved in up front and I think Tommy Conroy had, had kind of contributed to that this year as well but like you add Killeen O'Connor to the mix there it is an exciting team and, and they would kind of get found out without Killeen O'Connor at the weekend but why didn't they go route one a little bit more in the second half I don't know 
I don't know, it doesn't make any sense. And as somebody pointed out, it was actually, it ended up being Aidan O'Shea kicking high balls into where Aidan O'Shea should have been. Like, the, the system broke down because the system hadn't been ingrained enough or clearly defined where, you know, we talk about the identity of teams. Tyrone's identity is, is very, very clear, and we'll get to that in a couple of minutes. Yeah, just one other thing we want to get to in the bad uh, this morning uh, in the red, uh, Irish rugby. Uh, you might have seen this uh, yesterday, uh, the, uh, an apology being issued from the IRFU and Leinster Rugby over uh, an unacceptable error that forced teams to change in pretty appalling conditions, I think it's fair to say. We have um, uh, footage up here on screen, uh, nothing like getting forced to change in these conditions with rats running around. This was uh, at Energia Park yesterday at an Interpro's doubleheader. Um, like this is a Connacht player who had, who had shared that footage and you can see there that they were like absolutely horrific conditions that they were forced to change and as I said the mention of rats there as well which you couldn't actually identify in the video there's an IRFU statement that came out saying that they would like to apologise to players, management and representatives of Connacht and Ulster sorry for the inconvenience caused by an unacceptable error in relation to the positioning of temporary changing facilities they said due to current government guidelines changing facilities are not available for amateur rugby teams these temporary facilities should have been set up in a more appropriate area the IRFU and Leinster Rugby are extremely sorry for the inconvenience to the teams and the upset this unacceptable error has caused. Yeah, as somebody made the point, uh, the Tyrone and Mayo lads aren't getting uh, changed down the alleys of Drumcondra. They too are an amateur team, so um, justifiably outrage from people suggesting this would never happen to the men. It's ludicrous to suggest that uh, this is something to do with the amateur stuff. Eventually the IRFU come out and apologise but it just isn't good enough and everybody knows it's not good enough and really every time there's like a quantum leap forward for women's sport in Ireland you still get dragged back in by uh, crap like this. So, um, you know, we're just trying to highlight that this morning. This is still going on. Uh, we will move on to the Amber, the meh, the grand and in here we are going with the chasing pack. This is a kind of a, a zoomed out version of, of what the football championship might look like over the next couple of years as a result of what we saw on on Saturday. So I guess like what are, what are the lessons that some of the counties who aren't favourites for the All-Ireland Championship over the next couple of years, what, what are the lessons that they can take away from Tyrone actually uh, prevailing? Like I, I guess what they could take away in a positive sense is that Tyrone won a lot of close matches this year they managed to get to they managed to, to to get into a fight with Kerry managed to get into a fight with with, with Mayo and 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 win convincingly enough in in both occasions or look like a much better team you go through their their Ulster championship and when it came to the close calls they managed to prevail so getting close to teams is is obviously the first step and then also the the kind of from nothing nature of their win it is possible to to kind of get to the promised land from a from a fairly tough position earlier in the year but I think I'm kind of clutching at straws there at maybe some of the, the positives that other teams can take from this. I think in reality what we have here is an outstanding Tyrone team. And I, like, there was a bit of blowback when I described them as a brilliant team on Twitter on, on Saturday. And I, I think people still have yet to be convinced that this is a brilliant team. People are still pointing to circumstance yeah. for why they won this year. So, like, what, I w- what circumstance though? The fact that like <laughs> McShane, who was a contender for Football of the Year a couple of years back, wasn't fit enough to start. Well, like, well I mean that's it and all of a sudden then you have him as an impact sub so like what teams can perhaps not take from this Tyrone uh, setup because this is quite unique to Tyrone to the Tyrone team and to the very top teams is first of all the depth that they have in this squad and as you mentioned there Colin McShane being an impact sub Derek Canavan being an impact sub like that, that is outrageous depth players of that quality to be coming off your bench to finish out an All-Ireland final and All-Ireland semi-final that is the stuff of champions in attack right there They've got a couple of players who are deemed good enough to be professional uh, Australian footballers. Like, I mean, this is uh, like this, this is the level that the likes of McShane and McKenna are operating at. McKenna has succeeded in Australia. He wasn't just a prospect. He was a success story. have got Brian Dew, who I don't think many counties have uh, a, a man like that on the sideline, a, a success like that on the, the sideline, a winner like that on the sideline. They've got an incredible amount of resources that have been used in the right way, which is important. That you can't just throw money at a problem. Like, I mean, the, the, their Garvahi Centre has been the envy of a lot of Ulster over the last little while. Their coaching set up completely, it seems, self-sustained at the moment. Their, their backroom team, all people from Tyrone, even just the way they had to fight to, to get Peter Donnelly back into the SNC uh, set up after the great job he did and then being lured away from Tyrone. Getting him back was important. Getting McKenna back, as I mentioned, was important. Keeping McShane at home. 
everybody is on side, everybody realises the importance that every Tyrone person can play in their success. Maybe that is something that other counties can learn from, actually, rather than being unique to Tyrone. They've got a completely football-obsessed county, and I guess, really, the bottom line here is that this wasn't a very big shock at all. I think the reason why this was a big shock in... we got to put it into context of the year, and I think the COVID situation is still in the minds of people when they're a little bit surprised by what happened on Saturday. And that's fair enough. But I think if we separate that from the team that we're witnessing here and the management and the entire setup in Tyrone GEA, once Dublin got knocked out, I think this wasn't a very big shock at all. I think that I think I think COVID is the reason why this is the unlikely win that it is. Yeah, for the chasing pack, I think the ability to get close to Tyrone will give them some hope. I think the chasing pack can also look at what Tyrone did the uh, the type of defensive system that they have which isn't the out and out sweepers which wasn't the really boring let's kick the ball back all the time it's a, an intelligent iteration it's smart it's still aggressive it's still trying to win games as opposed to not lose them and that's the sea change in mentality that seems to be with their approach and you would really hope I think a lot of teams are doing that I think Armagh have that I think Monaghan have that I think Donegal hopefully will have something that they come back with next year and hopefully get a bit of strength and depth from what happened for them for, for this year as well. And so all of a sudden, all of those counties must be thinking, well, if we can just get out of whatever championship we have, uh, then we're in with a shout. And the questions about what that championship may actually look like are going to be more important than ever over the next little while because what is it next month we will discover how exactly it's going to look over the next little while. And it's going to be very interesting to see how, how certain parties vote in that because uh, like I, I think no matter what way you paint it up, I think that the current structure, even if you go back to the Super 8 structure, I think it's just harder for Ulster teams to, to survive. I think, of course, if there's a back door and you get knocked out of the Ulster Championship, you're, you're all well and good and you can maybe build a bit of momentum through the Super 8s if you get that far. But it's still harder to be an Ulster team. So maybe the, I'm not sure, the, the Ulster people, the Ulster delegates vote in favour of keeping the Ulster Championship because it's such a great money spinner and genuinely a great championship or do they vote to try and bring more parity to the competition? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've got to say, I think the Ulster Championship is one of the reasons why Ulster Counties have won so few All-Irelands. Like, it's it's an immediate war that you have to go through and then you get to the end of the war and everybody's there like, hey, nice to see you and it's the Dubs and it's Kerry and they're like, happy days, you've all killed each other. They're like, I mean, you can barely walk and you're still playing. Like, that's exactly what has happened. If they could just see past it, then this would be a, a new bright dawn for the Ulster counties in, like, slashing their way through the rest of the country and winning all Ireland. But local rivalries are the things that are most important to people. So, um, I don't know. We'll come back to that because that's... Um, John Fogarty is out in the papers today that the annual congress that was slated for this month has been put back to October for the GA to give more times to the counties to have a, a think about what's coming next and we could be going back to 2017 we could be going back to before the Super 8s we could be going to the Super 8s or we could be going to either of the two new proposals that have been put forward but they both need a 60% they need to reach more than 60% and when there's two proposals that are going forward it's very hard for either of them to reach more than 60% so because one of them will be more popular than the other, but it might not be so popular that it gets uh, the the mandate. And if it doesn't get the mandate, then then there'll be a vote and to go back to the Super 8s. And if that doesn't happen, which, let's face it, might not happen because mm. a lot of people didn't think the Super 8s were very good. And certainly the way they were constituted with Dublin having two home games as opposed to everybody else, uh, that wasn't fair. And then we go back to 2017. Was the 2017 championship pretty good? That wasn't great. No. Good okay. final, pretty good final, but uh, that was that was about it. Yeah, like that, that, there is no consensus whatsoever when you look at people talking about this about what what is actually going to be the best proposal. For me, it's clear, uh, and we've done this on the show before, what the best championship proposal is, and it's not reconstituting the provinces. It's not that one. It's the other one. It's a Plan B, I think. But I don't see that reflected in GEA circles and people who've who've actually kind of voiced an opinion on it. So maybe they're giving themselves extra time that everybody knows exactly what is best for the GAA over the next couple of years so that everybody gets behind the thing that that, that needs to happen because you're like it's it's just it's just not gonna be the reality if, if you're gonna need sixty percent. So that's gonna be very interesting to see how that plays out. Wouldn't it be great if we could see Mayo against Tyrone in a championship match every year? That's what we should be thinking. Like this the quality of the football was excellent. The the drama was 
like edge of your seat stuff until the penalty miss and the goal got scored and after that it was absolutely clear what was going to happen but um, well anyway. I, still, I still like I mean it's still an enjoyable game oh like, absolutely yeah well, I've just seen people giving out about the quality of the football and you're like oh come on really the athleticism right. and skill that we've seen here is like far superior to the stuff that we saw 20 years ago let alone 40 years ago like that's a good opportunity to just like flick on to, to the good here and straight on to Tyrone because we, like I mean once Paddy Hamsey comes up and like fires that one over the bar with the outside of the boot like that's the moment where if you think that the quality of the game is not at a high enough level you probably need to park your arguments at that point because I don't know they did it all against Kerry in the semi-final all three of their full back line uh, came up for scores and immediately they set that tone against Mayo where they have like it is they have it seems like they've taken a, a player like Paddy Hamsey and cloned him 13 times that that is what the Tyrone team is that they like they have kind of everything that the hard tackling aggressive nature when they're when they don't have the ball and then this unbelievably skillful ability when they have the ball in hand and I like I think it might become a bit of a cliche over the next little while that like, Tyrone don't get enough credit for the footballers that they are. I hope that it doesn't become the reality because I think on now. Saturday night it yeah. proved what a, it's not just the street smarts and the intelligence that they have. To be able to, for, for intelligence to be used to good effect, you need to have incredible footballers. And here's the thing, their footballers are actually better footballers than Mayo's footballers. Uh, that whole kind of, oh, Mayo are a great footballing county, but actually Mayo had the athletes and the workers and... Tyrone had the footballers who had who were two footed, who were kicking long range points, who were finding pockets of space. There's five points that you can think of that were scored by five individuals in the Tyrone team, where they manufactured space for themselves, or they took what looks like you know oh, low percentage outside of the boot from 40 yards straight over the black spot, mm. like and you never you actually didn't really think that they were going to go wide, and it's at a, a level that. Mayo don't have and that many of the other counties actually don't have and that's the bit that I think that we need to give Toronto credit for Like I know it's been we've, we've absolutely uh, buried this talking point down through the years about the importance of, of goalkeepers but it goes without saying now that really on Saturday night I think that kills the debate about whether or not your goalkeeper should be coming out to contribute with play because Mayo were a man down when Niall Morgan was in possession nobody was closing him down because what we had was an entirely man to man set up yeah. So nobody was going to leave their man to, to, to tackle the 15th man on the pitch. Well, let, let's do that talking about with Anthony Malls in a moment because there's one other bit that we've got to get to here in the performance rankings. Yeah, we're just going to have a, a quick mention for Radicani, one of the, the great sports stories of 2021. Uh, if you're sitting at home after the All-Ireland on Saturday night, you were probably watching this. I think it was like something like 7 to 8 million uh, British people were watching this on Channel 4 on Saturday night as she won the US Open, started the tournament as a 400 to 1 outsider and never in the history of tennis has anyone fought through three qualifying rounds of a Grand Slam before winning the entire thing. There was just a slew of ridiculous moments about her path through this season, her path through this tournament, and it all concluded with an ace on the final point to win it in, in some fashion. She was ranked 150th before the tournament. She is now up to 23rd, and she won as a qualifier without dropping a single set. Now, winning as a teenager... It's not unusual. I think there's been three teenagers that have won majors over the last few years. But it's the way in which this particular teenager has done it, which has been incredible. Because if we go back to Wimbledon, I think on the show we were drawing the comparison between herself and the English football team about how there is this ridiculous pressure heaped on you for no reason whatsoever except for the fact that you were British. And honestly, I wasn't sure how good Emma Raducanu was in during Wimbledon. Uh, we all now know uh, how absolutely phenomenal she is. Uh, Martina Navratilova says nobody does it fast this fast this well she said her rise has been beyond meteoric I've never seen it before that is the truth and what does what it say in the Telegraph? The Daily Telegraph like, it's on the very front page it's her lifting the trophy at the Champions Dinner and it's uh, instant icon Emma holds all the aces you're like yeah fair enough they're projecting forward Champion Raducanu ready for anything yeah that's uh, good to know and then the third most important thing is Superstar humbled by the Queen's support that's obviously very, very important that we get the mention of the Queen on the front page of the Telegraph somehow gooseberrying her way into the credit of the uh, incredible teenager who's just won. There was a, a line in The Guardian saying, even a rare message from the Queen, one ER congratulating another. So there you go, the same initials, uh, apparently. Uh, the headline on that Guardian piece was that she could become Britain's first billion-dollar athlete. So uh, no pressure to win loads of Grand Slams. Uh, you got to become uh, a billion-dollar athlete as well. Uh, they spoke to Mark uh, Borkowski, who has worked with Michael Jackson, Joan Rivers and Led Zeppelin, 
who said this is the start of something. She's a billion dollar girl, no doubt about it. She is the real deal. It's not just that she plays extraordinary tennis. It's also her background, her ethnicity, her freedom of spirit. People also love the fact that she is vulnerable, but laughs the pressures away. So uh, there is plenty of, uh, I, I would say, uh, fully patronising things still being said about uh, oh, yeah. a, a US Open champion. It. But um, I think uh, I think this is the start of something special. To be it's sure. five minutes past eight. That is this week's performance rankings. We're going to be back next with Anthony Moyles. OTBAM's performance rankings with Gillette. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. The Football Pod with Paddy and Andy, our new weekly Gaelic football show with Paddy Andrews and Andy Moran. We lost that championship game against Donegal. We didn't lose a game for seven years after that. I tell you, we were angry after that game. Dublin came back, I remember, in 2015. It was, we're putting this right. I signed with the Rod squad in 2011, that summer. Uh, do you know what like, you hear? I signed at the back of a smoke pack. I w- was not far off that. Roddy, I, w- I would say, is like the Irish Harry Redman. Download the OTB Sports app and subscribe to the GAA podcast feed now. Car insurance is boring, but you don't have to be. Get Set Go is the kind of car insurance you can sort in a few minutes online, then bounce on with your day. Are you ready for quick start insurance? Get a quote now at getsetgo.ie. MCL Insurance Services Ireland Limited Trading is getsetgo.ie is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. OTB AM With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. Kieran McGeary, All-Ireland champion. You won't tire of hearing that one. Oh, my God. Unbelievable, hey. Um, I've always wanted to say it and to hear it and, and to feel it has been amazing. Unbelievable. Talk to me about that game. When did you start believing that this is, we have this, we have this game here? You sort of have to have a lot of belief coming into the game, and I think we knew that. Um, we train exceptionally well. We, we behave like All-Ireland champions. We trust and honour each other like All-Ireland champions. So it was just a matter of going out there today and becoming that, and, and thankfully we did. Bit of commotion here as Niall Morgan walks by us. Talk to me about his performance today. Ah, sure, the man's. He kicked one from, from Quinn's bar the last day, so he did, and he just people were over the moon and delighted with him and, and surprised that he'd done it. But we see that every night of training. We see him pull off them types of saves every single night. And when you see him do that and then go out and do it on the pitch, like you just know the animal he is. Everyone in the building does this All-Ireland Final. We're calling it a 50-50 game. But the two underdogs that come through the semi-finals after two epic wins. How, what's the conversation like in the camp before that? Are you are you putting the chest out and saying, this is ours, boys? Yeah, totally. Hey, that's the scary thing about, about an underdog. You know, they, they have absolutely nothing to lose and everything to gain. And I think Mayo showed that in the semi-final. We showed it in our semi-final. And today was obviously going to be ding dust. We knew that. Um, right to the final whistle. Do you know, I'm just so glad we got over the line. My heart goes out to the Mayo players. Uh, you know, the respect they showed there at the end of the game has been exceptional. You know, the real leaders talk about trendsetters and, and passion setters in GAA. Um, they have been it. You know, Keegan's a leader, Turkin's a leader. And then boys will continue to do that non-stop. Can you talk to me about the second half? The game's in the melting pot. Ryan O'Donoghue shaves the outside of the post. You were saying there that you, you hadn't actually seen it. And next thing, Colin McShane comes off the bench. He's not in, he's not in the shape, say, he's not back yet to where he can be. We know that, which is a scary proposition. It's scary, like. Talk to me about his impact off the bench. Look, we knew either way, if he started or if he, if he came on, he was going to be exceptional. Um, you know, off-the-cuff stuff. He got the flick to it. People would say it was lucky. He knew what he was doing. That's his first touch. He knew what he was doing. The big man delivers on big days. He loves a big occasion. So he does, and I'm absolutely delighted for him. The impact from the bench all year has been something we've all talked about. Derek Hannavan, Tiernan McCann, McShane, even Ben McDonald coming in today. What's that like when you know that the boys coming on the bench are going to be finishers? Ah, crazy. Honest, honestly, he's crazy. Um, it's just like you, you hit the reset button again and you know whenever the boys come on they're going to deliver strong, clear messages, circulates around the team and they want the ball, they don't hide. Derek Hannaman doesn't hide, Ben McDonald, Tiernan McCann, they don't hide when they come onto the pitch and that's why our bench has been exceptional all year. What was Conor McKenna like in the build-up to this game? Ah, oh, Conor, he's a Duracell bunny, so he is, you want to see him, he's bouncing around the show all the time. You know, we, we often give him a bit of stick about his horses and his, the dog racing he does. I heard they got a new greyhound this week. Yeah, sure, he's never done talking about it all the time, so he is, but no, look, Connor's a, a legend. Um, he knows the decisions he made, and, and this was a big decision he made for this reason. And to see him lift the Sam Maguire there today, I'm absolutely delighted for him. Can you tell me about the influence that Lo- uh, Fergal Logan and Brian Dewar have had in your career so far? Ah, uh, crazy. Um, I've been under Brian and Fergal now for a number of years, and... You really only have to talk to them for a minute and you'll know where the level they're going to bring you to. Nothing's complicated, it's hard work, it's passion. 
and the message all year was that Tyrone has an identity and we know what that was. What is that? Just we'll keep that in the locker room. <laughs> Last one, Kieran. right? You've, you've won this All-Ireland. You've come from nowhere in a lot of people's eyes to win it. But as we said, McShane wasn't at his best this year. McKenna's only home. Derek Canavan's still a kid. What's next? Well, look, there's a lot of young boys, um, you know, looking mad to get into that team now. We have a number of 21 panels, minor panels, getting the finals. And, you know, they're now wanting to be a part of that journey. And I was in that position one time too where I wanted to be part of it. You know, forefathers set the tone back 0, 3, 5 and 8, you know, and that's what you want to be part of. And to be sitting back at the top pay is the top table, you know, has just been unbelievable. Unbelievable. Kieran McGeary, All Ireland champion, congratulations. Thank you, cheers. Yeah, Kieran McGeary, potentially footballer of the year as well. That's a conversation we can begin uh, having. Maybe Niall Morgan is in the shout for that as well. Anthony Moyes is with us. Good morning to you, Anthony. How are you? Morning, gents. How are we doing? Who is the footballer of the year? Nice handy question to get you going here. <laughs> <laughs> you always like to spring one of these on me, Ger. Uh, I think Myler has to be in the mix. Um, you know, people probably won't give him the plaudits because he's not probably getting on the scoreboard an awful lot, but, but he's been a guy who, uh, there's he's been their go-to guy to take out, you know, one of the main opposition's uh, uh, leaders um, and their main threats. And he did that again last at the weekend with Durkin. Um, you know, he was phenomenal. Um, he obviously did it against Kerry too, so he's he, he's definitely in the mix. You know, I think McCurry I think deserves an awful lot of of of, of um, plaudits because you know he's a guy who probably went through a period where he came on the scene, you know, with a burst and you know was very very dangerous, but then was in and out of the team and and you know he cut a very frustra- frustrated figure for a while. I don't know if you remember, but there was a period there where, you know, Mickey Hart was trying lots and lots and lots of different, you know, kind of uh, um, connections up front, especially in the full forward line. And lads were getting whipped off, you know, at half time and even before half time. And there was a, you could sense the level of frustration in that forward line because things weren't clicking. Um, and I know he even spoke about it, that he went off himself and he had to, to find a dazzler or whatever it, it, he calls himself. So it's interesting, you know, because he came back and he's been phenomenal this year. You know, very, very confident. He stands over a free kick. I was, you know, I was in at the game and I was chatting to the guy beside me. I was just saying, there's a massive confidence in the rest of the Tyrone players. They all turn around, they walk away. Like literally it's from wherever there's a free, it's going to go over. You know, he has such a nice style. Um, he's massive confidence and obviously he scores 1-4 in an All-Ireland that's, that's not bad going Yeah and I think actually this is one of the other aspects of it talking to a, a Tyrone supporter in the aftermath of the game I was like oh it's a big change from last year and uh, the Tyrone people certainly the ones that I was talking to in the aftermath of the game were full sure that there was still a lot of Mickey Hart in that team Um I'm not. I'm not as sure about it as they might be, and I'm, I, I don't know. If, like obviously, there's an intense loyalty to uh, Mickey for what he did over that period of time, but stuff like McCurry, stuff like the absence of an out and out sweeper, is actually a transformative thing for for the individuals, where where there's clearly confidence instilled in the players. You know, we trust that you're going to be somebody who's vital to us. We're not going to take you off when things go wrong. We're not going to take you off the freeze if you miss one or two of them, and then not having a sweeper is like a we trust you as defenders. And you have to you have to be the one who's going to be responsible, as opposed to looking for one of your mates to come and rescue you. It's just it, they're small and they're subtle differences, but they're hugely important at the end of the season. Massively, massively important. And and I think it's, you know, I heard I heard uh, uh, um, uh, Colin Cavanaugh talking there last week about the fact of the, the change. And I was I heard a lot of debate post the game of well, you know, have they changed much, you know, since since Mickey Hart's time? And I think they've changed a massive amount. Um, as a matter of fact, in a very, very short space of time and in, in an even more confined space of time due to everything that's gone on with COVID. So they've had to make these alterations very quickly and they've had to make alterations post the Kerry game because he referenced, even do a reference that Kerry game, the league game again, like, I mean, at a very, very important time, he referenced that game on, on, on Saturday evening. So that game had a, had a massive imprint on what they did this year and how they viewed what they were going to do going forward. Um, you know, I spoke to Andy McGinley about this. He felt that they were trying something in that Kerry game and it was completely, it just didn't work at all. And they kind of went, right, okay, well, where we're parking that, we're not going to go there. Of course, there's still an imprint from Mickey Hart's time. You know, there, there's still an awful lot of players, obviously, who were there from Mickey Hart's time. So you're not going to completely rip everything up overnight. And there was no need to do it. But certainly the sweeper had to be ha- had to be taken out. And it was interesting, Colin Cavanagh talking about it, because, you know, predominantly he was the one who was, who was obviously employed in that position. So 
when you're when you're playing that sweeper system and you're and, and, and if you remember Tyrone, what they would do is they'd obviously get the bodies behind the ball, they would try to snag you, and then it would look to break. There's a there's a subtle difference now in the sense of they're tagging men as they come back and they're applying a lot more pressure around the middle third of the field. Um, they're also trusting themselves, as you say. They're trusting themselves to be one-on-one. That full back line have no problem being one-on-one. You know, like Hamsey uh, um, has had no issue taking on some of the best lads one-on-one. And they're, and they're comfortable with having their buddy beside them and saying, listen, if it's two-on-two in here, we'll take that. We don't need extra protection. So that, of course, affords you to allow p- players to be further up the pitch. And, of course, it affords you to have more forward threat when you get the ball. Um, and have more energy, and uh, you know, ultimately, I think that's the that's that's the key difference to 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 what Doher and Logan have brought to this team. It's interesting. The cliche about Tyrone Anthony was that they love being an underdog. They love being written off, and I kind of thought that they weren't being written off whatsoever before the weekend, except for one area, which was they were going to win the midfield battle. There's there's no chance that Tyrone are going to win the midfield battle because of what happened to them in the, the semi-final that they won in spite of the fact that Niall Morgan's long kickouts weren't doing any damage. As it turned out, his long kickouts in the All-Ireland final all of a sudden did, did massive amounts of damage. So that Tyrone midfield, not just the middle third, that midfield, how impressed were you with their emergence as, as real top-class stars on Saturday night? Well, I think, you know, we spoke about this prior or post the Kerry game. Like, I, t- I, I didn't think he would be under the same pressure because Ruan and Loftus are more... They're not your classic old-style midfielder to say David Moore is, as in a big man who's able to go up six foot four and he's able to catch ball and he's able to put ma- massive pressure across that middle, that, that, that whole middle section of the, of, 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 of the pitch. You know, they're kind of more half forwards. Ruan's a bit bigger than Love, but they're kind of more of a half forward, very, very mobile, very able to go at you, you know, pick up ball and run at you, rather than being really dominant under a high ball. So when I looked at that kind of Mayo team, I said, you know what, I don't see many fellas who are going to go up and fetch ball over the two boys who are in the Tyrone panel. And what they learned was, and if you watch it, they look for a lot of tap downs, tap downs overhead, tap downs to fellas coming running. And they essentially took that kind of, you know, that I suppose that contest out of the game. They, they, mo- most of the big moments came from a situation where Morgan was under pressure on a short kick out and he was confident enough that he was just going to letter this ball 60 yards and let them fight for it. And actually Mayo men, if you watch it, got caught in front an awful lot of the time where they were kind of backpedaling you know, under a lot of pressure and Tyrone guys were in behind knowing that he has the ability to go that long. So, you know, it's interesting, as you say, Owen, there was that feeling that, you know, his kickouts would be under pressure, but he he wasn't at all. Um, You know, I was in there, I was was on the lower Hogan, I was at him first, I had had a brilliant view of, of his ability to pick out guys and he never, ever once was under pressure in my view. Like, I mean, certainly his, his exterior didn't show anything as regards him being under pressure. You know, he was well able to ping ones out to his left when he needed short. He was well able to off the outside of his right boot, put them out over to the sideline. But I also thought Mayo, Mayo, you know, Mayo made it relatively easy for him uh, uh, on a lot of the kickouts. And I just think Mayo, I, I don't, I think I think they thought what was going to happen against Kerry with, with his kickouts would happen again. And I think they planned for that. And I think they got a little bit caught out by it. Um, they allowed players essentially they, they seem to be allowing a plus one to happen um, and had more players in around the middle middle section and they were allowing easy kickouts to happen especially out to morgan's right um invariably a half forward would come down and there would be a bit of confusion and he'd just pop it out and and, and they'd start to attack um the two the two midfield i have to say they absolutely emptied themselves they were brilliant they broke up attacks um, uh, I think it was Kirkpatrick, I think, who got, or no, it was actually Brian Kendi who got an early yellow, and I was a bit worried for him. I thought it was, you know, it was rough enough yellow, um, and, I, and I didn't think he'd last, but he had a phenomenal game. So, um, yeah, it was a, certainly a section that I think they 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 they, they dominated. But it's interesting to hear, Owen, and I, 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 you know, I'd like, I think, I think this this thing is an amazing thing. And you'll probably slip into the Mayo stuff on this as well, but it's interesting to hear uh, Tommy talking to McGeary there. And he mentioned identity, you know, and he said, we have an identity, uh, he said, and we were reminded of that. Now, if you want to go with identity and you want to talk about Tyrone, well, even more so than Peter Canavan, who I think was just an unbelievably, phenomenally talented player, the man who epitomized the identity of Tyrone in those 2000s was Brian Doerr. You know, he was a fella who, when we played them, 
we earmarked him as, as the guy just to take out more so than Kavanaugh or anyone. He needed to be man-marked throughout the game. He was the beating heart of the team. You know, not a very, very big man, not a very, very fast pick. I mean, he didn't, you wouldn't be putting him at the kind of nine out of 10 in anything if you were if you were putting the characteristics of a Gaelic footballer up. But I tell you what, for heart, determination, and, and drive and ruthlessness, he was that. And McGeary, I know, said we'd keep our identity to the dressing room. But I'd say that was absolutely their identity and what they were really honing in on. Um, and when I look at Mayo, I'm kind of going, where is their identity? You know, what if I was putting it up on the wall in three, three, three words, I, 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 still think they're, I still think they're grasping for that. And I still actually think that when it comes down to it, that ruthlessness, that identity that Tyrone have is ultimately what brought them across the line. One of the things, I was talking about this a little bit earlier on, was um, the... The space, and I think this might feed into the, the point you made about Niall Morgan having somebody to kick the ball out to. Essentially, Henley stays in goals. He is a goalkeeper. Uh, you know, obviously he'll come out a little bit, but not not on the press, not the way when they were down to 14 men that Cluxon came out and, and added a plus one to make sure that there was nowhere for Kerry to kick the ball out in the last minute of the game uh, in the drawn game in 19. Uh and it just seems like Ulster football is ahead of the curve with everybody else. Like Tyrone had to overcome Monaghan, who are giving them this weird stuff they've never seen before. And it's like, just the brain power required to think about that is different from the challenge that Mayo had faced. And as a result, Mayo have been happy enough to keep Henley in goals. But certainly you're watching it and it's man on man the whole pitch and Henley's in goals and Tyrone are finding someone to kick the ball out to even though they have a goalkeeper who has to kick the ball out to him. You're like, how's that happening? Yeah, Do we, it, 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 is is that a problem for the rest of the country to start thinking about and fixing immediately? I I think it's funny. You know, I often thought about this. I remember sitting down with Kiro Magini a couple of years ago, and we were talking about midfield and how he felt midfield was going to change from the big man in midfield of our days when you just kicked out, lamped out the ball into the middle of the pitch. You know, and and. and I remember he was reading uh, Moneyball, the book, you know, when I was sitting down having a coffee with him and I was asking him, I'd never seen the, or heard about the movie and I was chatting to him about it. So McGinney was a guy, obviously, and still is a guy who thinks about the game and he, and he tries to look well ahead of where changes will occur in the game. And then I met him a couple of years later and we were chatting about different things and he was trying, if you remember, to play this sweeper keeper. Um, and he was being lambasted, actually, for it. Um, you know, fellas were saying, what's he doing? You know, this is ridiculous. The crowd were going bananas when, when, when the keeper would come out, you know, even beyond the 21 with the ball. Imagine that. Well, now you have lads who are obviously soloing all the way up into the opposition half. And it is, it's a player. You know, he, he may have number one on his back. He might have a big pair of gloves. But at the end of the day, he should have the skills and the adaptability to be able to play the game just as an outfield player. And essentially that's what's happening. You know, I've often said myself, how many times do you really have a shot stop? You might have two in a game, maybe three, but how many times do you get the ball in your hands as a keeper? You could get it 15, 20, 25 times, especially if you're just giving a short kick out and getting it back. So essentially you could play with a sweeper keeper and this is what you have going on, especially as you say in Monaghan. So when you look at the two teams, Ger, some of the biggest moments happened in that game on, on Saturday night where one team had a, had a goalkeeper who was absolutely adept at being able to come out off his line, take the ball on, deliver long-range passes out of his hand. If you remember the chance for... for, for, for um, McCurry. For McCurry, yeah, that came from him stepping out. He comes out of the pocket, he's happy, and he drills this beautiful long-range right for the ball right down on top of McKenna who manages... To, to get because it was on, it reminded me of the, the, the Donegal Dublin game. Um, but let's look at the goal situation. Like, if you remember, uh, there was a ball put in, I think, by O'Donoghue, and he came out off his line, and it was a male man about to catch it, and there was danger all over it if he caught the ball. And he came out and he went out over the top of the male man and got his fist on it. Actually, I think, sorry, he, he grabbed it above him, came down with the ball, and it could have been for that chance. And then let's switch to the Henley uh, uh, and McShane goal. So if you if you go and watch that, rewind that again, Conor Myler gets the ball out under the the, the, the the Hogan stand. You know, he's about probably 30 metres out. Um, and I've been here before and I know exactly the situation. McShane makes a bit of a run forward. He doubles back and he points across with his left hand as if to put it just basically out into the D. And the ball that Myler puts in, 
actually doesn't bring him out to the D, but means that he has to back up. And if you watch this, the, the, as the ball is kicked, Henley is actually standing behind his line on the goal line. He's not even out of, out, out of the goal a little bit. He's, 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 he's actually standing behind the goal line. Whereas, you know, if that's Morgan or if that's a guy who's thinking, listen, I'm actually playing more as a defender than a goalkeeper, he's probably standing outside the small parallelogram or he's probably even six or seven yards out. So when Myler looks up to even give the pass, Myler sees two against one. So he says, well, I'm not putting the ball in there. Um, and in, invariably, if he does try to pass, well, then you have a man coming from behind who, by the way, if I'm a defender, I'm saying, listen, if there's anything above my head and I'm backing up, you come, you clean me, him and everything around you. Um, and if you watch it, as the ball is in flight, of course, you know, Henley hesitates a bit. Then he goes um, and McShane just gets the flick on it and back of the net. Um, and ultimately, that was a massive, massive change in the game because, you know, Mayo were coming back well into it. They had started well the second half. You could you'd see they'd increased their energy levels. They were chasing Tyrone down more um, and, 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 and they were really starting to threaten. And that was a big, big, big uh, uh, um, factor in the game. And, that, and that's even outside of, I know your point you're making, that's even outside of the rest of the game where, you know, Morgan is adding value as he's coming out as, say, a link man, whereas Henley, as you say, is basically being used as a goalkeeper. So I think most teams around the country are going to have to decide um, are going to have to look at it because essentially it is an extra player. Exactly. And like, I wonder, is it just hammered home a little bit more this year? Anthony, not so much because Niall Morgan's in an All-Ireland final, but because of the way the game has developed this year in particular, where the blanket defence has been phased out really, uh, like quite emphatically this year, where you almost look at a game as a proper 15 on 15. It's just a collection of pairs all around the pitch. So your goalkeeper all of a sudden is the one person who's not being marked. There is no systemic defence where, you know, you've got a, a cornerback who can make a burst through. It is literally your goalkeeper who is the only free man on the pitch. And as a result of that, it's become the year where Niall Morgan, the, the possibly the best outfielder who's actually playing in goals for his county, actually triumphs. Absolutely. Well, you know... <laughs> My wife does basketball, and I was actually chatting to her about it. And it was she always it amazed her over the last number of years, where she'd say like, "Why, why doesn't the guy in goals come out with the ball?" You know, and I was kind of saying, "Yeah, he, he probably should." You know, like because he could be the point guard. You know, that's essentially it. Um, and I think they're turning more into the point guard now. They're turning more into a person who's able to dictate. Because the old adage was, I'll let the keeper have it. Jesus, let the keeper have it. You know, he'll, he'll kick it up his arse or something like this, you know, because it was always the feeling that they were absolutely useless with the ball in hand. Well, <laughs> that is no longer, that's no longer the thing. You know, they can come, they can deliver long passes. If you saw, he, he also delivered a lovely hand pass. I think, can't remember who it was to, um, but he popped it out over about three or four guys into the path of, of one of the cornerbacks who just raced down the middle of the field. It could have been Frank Burns. Um, so once you have those skills, um, you know, as, a, as the opposition, you're now saying, well, what do we do? Do we leave him with the ball? Do we try and snag him? Do we try and corral him into a section? Um, do we just mark everybody else up and kind of say, yeah, come on out with the ball, come out 40, 50, 60 yards and slowly, you know, slowly kind of pull in on him. Um, but if he's really, really, really good, all of a sudden he can come out those 20 or 30 yards and he can deliver a bomb which which happens you know straight down into the in, into your full back line um and the way teams are playing if you're smart enough what you would do then is you would run towards him as a forward unit and leave your big man or your two one and one inside and just let him deliver those balls because ultimately those keepers are also they're delivering a ball from an area where it can cause the maximum amount of damage so like i think look it's it's, it's a tactic that i think a lot of people will be looking at and it's in a brilliant every year there's always something different you know uh that everyone goes oh geez we must do that um but the smart guys will obviously be thinking okay what do we do post this so yeah. what do we do actually to stop this or what do we do to even enhance it even more the uh fear that's is manifest from Owen and from uh, the Kerry people here is that Tyrone are here now for another decade of dominance that they're going to be the team of the uh, the 20s as well you can kind of see it in Owen this morning you can see it Amy Fitzmaurice <laughs> is uh, this could be the start of something big for Tyrone and they don't like it obviously they don't like it because there's a particular peculiar set of ghosts that Tyrone bring for uh, for Kerry are they here for like is, is this a, a a one-off. I mean, we, we obviously always live in the now and go, geez, this team's going to be very hard to beat. But are Dublin looking at this? Are Kerry thinking, ah, Jesus, we had that. 
we, we were definitely able to win that semi-final if a few things had gone our way. Does, does the win annoy people, inspire them? If, if the Dubs get Paul Mannion back, are they thinking, we can have those lads, come on? I, th- I think there's I think there's two ways of looking at it actually. Um, I think Owen and his his kin are are are, are right to be worried uh, because I actually think you, you mean own... the impartial football observer, Anthony. <laughs> That's exactly it, Owen. That's exactly it. <laughs> like the rest of us. I, no, I. You know it's funny. I look back on the game and I was I I, I watched it again last night. Um, I think Tyrone were very very smart the way they played. Um, and they got the goals at vital times. Um, and you could say that, you know, uh, especially, you know, nearly decisions were made for them. Like, I mean, if you look at the Henley goal, uh, the, the one, as I said, we just spoke about there, the McShane one, and even the, even the, even the, the McKenna hand pass across, you know, there was always a thing what I, we, you know, we say in our defense is that, you know, you never, you never make up the mind of the forward. Don't make his mind up for him. Let him make the decision. And if you even watched that goal, lads rushed out and Henley rushed out and they made the decision. It was a brilliant no-look pass, but they made the decision for him rather than him having to make the decision. If you flip the far end when 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 um, uh, Tommy Conroy was on the run, the defenders backed off, they backed off. They kind of said, listen, if you take that bounce or extra solo, now we'll come in on you. But they made him make the decision. He made a rash decision, as did a number of the Mayo forwards. And they didn't get the goal. So Mayo will even look back on it and go, oh, we had chances. We had chances definitely for two or three goals. Um, definitely two, you know, even taken without taking out the penalty. So could they have been there? Could they have made it a lot tighter? Could they have even won it? Yes, they could have. But at the same time, I think Tyrone were in control of the game. Um, you know, Tyrone were shooting a lot well within the, the scores they were getting in the first half seemed to come a lot easier for mm. them. Um, they were well able to shoot from outside the range. So if you watch them, they were happy enough to get their shooters on the outside and clip over scores rather than going into, you know, the kind of the net that that Mayo would have wanted them to go into and then try to counterattack them and get up the field quick because that was Mayo's, Mayo's kind of strategy. So, you know, I look at Tyrone and I see the quality that they have. I see the leaders that they have. I see all the ability that they have. But I still think they're going to come through an Ulster Championship next year that's only getting better and better and better. When you look at Derry, when you look at Armagh, when you look at Monaghan, when you look at Donegal, like, I mean, there's teams emerging now that were, were, were kind of weaker in the last number of years, but are only getting stronger and stronger down. Um, so they're going to have a tough spell coming through Ulster. And then also, yes, I think... Kerry will look and go, you know what, for all the mistakes and all the messing and all the naivety that we that we had and displayed in that game, we were we were within, you know, a kick of a ball of bringing that game to the death. Um, and really, you know, if we had if we had spread the scores around a bit more and been a bit smarter, we probably should have won it. So I don't think they'd be shaking in their boots just yet. Um, I really don't think so, uh, uh, Jared, to be honest with you. But there's no doubt about it that Tyrone, um, I think, have, have brought something different um, but I don't think they're a team that are necessarily going to dominate for the next 10 years. Not not yet. What, what, what was your read on the Aidan o- O'Shea situation then, Anthony? Because I saw you tweeting about this at the weekend. Yeah, I just think, you know, I actually thought he played quite well. Um, I, I thought Mayo used him smart in the first half. They used him as a big man. Like, I mean, my team with Aiden, like I've marked Aiden when he was a young lad, um, and he, and he's a physically physically massive man. I probably had I don't know maybe ten years on him, and and I thought I would have had the strength on him. But he's he's a big big man as everyone knows. But he's also quite quick over those first three or four yards. He's well able to move, um, and once he has his arms out, it's impossible to get around him. So you have to nearly you have to allow him to get the ball, or you have to foul him. So when he gets the ball. If he has runners coming off them left or right, his hands are good enough to be able to shift left, shift right, and then he has runners. Mayo didn't, they did it a little bit in, in the first 20, 25 minutes of the, fir- the first half, but actually they started to really get it going in those last 10 minutes. And they should have had, if you remember, a goal out of it near the, near the end of the first half. Um, I think it was, uh, it wasn't Hora, it was, it was um, Oshin Mullen, I think, went past him and he just slipped him a little hand pass, lovely little hand pass. But, they, when they use him as a fulcrum, as a focal point in that full forward line, and they were able to put balls in in front of him, it was working well. Um, when they allowed him then having to try to turn, take shots himself, that wasn't that wasn't great because that's not his game. So, you know, I was very disappointed. The responsibility was on his fellow players to be able to get off him, come at angles, you know, know that the ball is coming in, a little slip pass, and then stick it over the bar. 
but it was still causing enough panic. But in the second half, they completely abandoned it for yeah. some reason. I don't know why they did it. You know, he, he, he was still winning ball in front of Hansi, but the second half, they kind of said, no, you're going to drift out. Whether he drifted out himself, he was trying to get into the game. You would see he was trying to influence the game. He was getting on the ball around midfield. Um, and look, Aiden is never going to be scoring, you know, six, seven points for you. That's not the type of player he is. Um, but I thought, you know, I thought it was disappointing for me. I... Th- I I, there was a couple, I mean, of the six forwards that started for Mayo, you know, really only two of them, I would feel, or maximum three of them played uh, to the level that you have to play in an All-Ireland final. I think of the six defenders that started, possibly five of them played above the level. You know, Keegan was absolutely enormous. Like, I mean, just, you want to talk about players of the year, I think he has to go in there, even though he lost the All-Ireland final. Like, I mean, he was just phenomenal. Like, when they needed him, he made runs you know, run again after again after again, just saying, give me the ball, give me the ball, I'll do something with it. Um, his leadership was was phenomenal. Like, I mean, I just 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 to watch him, what he was doing, like McKenna, McCurry, they were both under savage pressure going after him. Um, and especially after Tyrone had taken Durkin out because they obviously focused on him and they said, well, we're not going to let him do the damage that he normally does. But there was a couple of other lads and, and unfortunately for Mayo, and we spoke about this prior to the game again, they had zero impetus and zero threat off the bench, really, lads, yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, they had no one to come in who was a full forward or a corner forward who was going to come in and score four or five points no. and say, give me the ball. And and and, and unfortunately, that 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 really, that, that told on them. And obviously, the Killian O'Connor injury was ultimately probably caught up with them. A bridge too far, definitely. Anthony, good stuff. Thanks a million for joining us. Cheers. No bother, lads. Cheers. Anthony Moyes giving us his thoughts there on the All-Ireland football final. We're going to talk about the Camogie final with the Galway captain after a late surge won the game for them um, against the Cork side who were dogged and uh, that one definitely went and could have gone either way in the end. But Galway, the All-Ireland champions, we're going to speak with their captain a little bit later on. We're going to speak with Niall Morgan who is definitely a shout for footballer of the year. Certainly has one of the most interesting stories of the year. Uh, in about 15-20 minutes time as well it's 8.36 this morning OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette good mornings start with Gillette put your best face forward with their new and improved razors who's your footballer of the year? I think Conor Myler is probably going to be front and centre I think Niall Morgan I, I said to you after the Kerry game uh, you could put a, a few quid in him and see what happens but I think even despite being able to shout from out of the match on Saturday probably hasn't done enough because Myler was so good again the last day I think Kieran McGeary has a hell of a chance as well and it'll be between those three to Rome and for me to, to win it McCurry maybe uh, a very outside shot um, they have a lot of good footballers don't they that's the thing that's you think the thing. about it like Sludden McCurry Donnelly like just classicists who can kick the ball over as soon as you give them a tiny bit of space that long range shooting point that Anthony makes there it's like well, if you're going to beat us with 12 long range points then fair play to you it's like oh you just did that didn't you yeah do you know what it kind of feels like um kind of like a mid-tier Premier League team where a big team has signed a player but they've signed a good replacement immediately to replace them and they've got this constant revolving door of a like a, a really good level player except it's not the Premier League they have all these players and it felt like Donnelly's had good years here and there same with Sludden but they've got them all playing well together in one year and that's good management that's yeah. a really good culture and that's why they've won this year and I think it's identity everybody having a job the, the, Paddy Andrews said a great thing about uh, sitting down with Jim Gavin I don't expect you to score 10 points from play it's going to be very nice if you do but I expect you to do your job if you do your job and everybody else does their job we're going to be fine and there's a sense that everybody understands in Tyrone what their job is it's very clear it's clearly defined when you have the ball when you don't have the ball uh, you know and, and look again this is all post but it, it's post big matches now where they've displayed that consistently over the course of the year like Peter Hart is it fair to say he's had his best season this year and I he's think 30? so he's only 30 like he could go on to 34 35 yeah and that's you know they're going to be at the very top of their game for the next period of time as well so they, there was just everything in, in their game like we mentioned the Hamsey point earlier on there was the I mean the, the, the cuteness of the McShane uh, goal there was the art of the high fielding which we all thought was dead by Con Kilpatrick and also by Peter Hart, obviously. C- c- just a, a point on that. Okay, so Peter Hart does take his mark, but Kilpatrick doesn't take his mark, right? And there's mm. there's a world in which he is conditioned to take his mark, and we don't get that goal. Like it's it's a possibility. Why are we doing that? 
Uh, yeah, like I, I do think that when it comes to the midfield mark, it, it does feel that people like take the mark and then like just take the ball very quickly. Whereas with the advance mark, when it comes to the forward, they just stop and they compose themselves and they tap the ball over the bar. I think regardless of the mark in midfield, I think they'll always look to play the ball quickly. So I'm, I'm not sure it actually has. Let's uh, get rid of it totally. Can we not just get rid of it? I, 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 I like that. No, I, I like I like the midfield mark. I don't like the attacking mark, but I like the midfield mark. All right, okay. OTVAM brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. It's eight forty, and I'm delighted to say David Myler is back with us this Monday morning. David, how are you getting on? Morning, gentlemen. Um, what a what a very interesting weekend of Premier League action. Uh, mm. Liverpool, Liverpool were fairly sensational uh, against Leeds. I was flicking around at various stages and went and you know the way Sky do that recap and it was like shot 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 chance goal. And I was like, wow, this is uh, quite the impressive performance. Were they as good in overall play as they were in terms of the number of chances and shots they created? No, 100%. I think they were very good. Um, I think the team selection from Jurgen was very interesting. Obviously, giving Thiago the start over Henderson. Um, obviously, Harvey Elliott. We wish him all the best in his recovery. He deserved his place on his performances. But Thiago coming in just brought that bit of composure alongside Fabinho in terms of like dictating the pace. They were able to get on the ball, control it. Look, we know Bielsa is famous for the way he plays, where they're all frantic. They're up and down the pitch for 90 minutes. Um, but those, you know, the Liverpool midfield were able to add that bit of control and, you know, composure that when it did get frantic, you know, Thiago was able to put his foot in the ball and kind of manipulate it, move players around, get on the ball, make passes happen. And you know what? They, they fully deserved it. Thiago just seems a much better player when he's got Fabinho beside him. I think anyone would be a better player with Fabinho. It's just the control he asserts, you know, in that six where he's just, he's an exceptional at reading the game. Um, he takes up the right positions where he's intercepting passes or he's like making little tackles to, you know, stop counterattacks. He just, like I, I spoke about Thiago adding composure. Fabinho is very good at it. It, it. it almost looks like he's always in third gear when he gets on the ball. Um, he always makes the right decision. He's able to pick up pockets, you know, to get on the ball, to play forward. Obviously, like I said, when you know opposition are trying to get forward, then he's very good at breaking it up, and he just he just inserts calmness to the team, um, and that's you know it's an incredible trait to have. He doesn't look phased, um, like he's not blessed with blistering pace to get himself out of you know bother or whatever. But it's just the positioning he always picks up, and then look, good players you know feed off that, and good players love playing with good players, and you can see that with Thiago when they're in there. There's this nice little link between them where the you know, they're always passing and you know looking to create angles to play the ball forward. It, it does seem as well with Thiago that there is maybe more of a goal threat about him this season, like arriving late into the box. Maybe it's just Leeds yesterday. Like in fairness, Liverpool should have been three 0 up at half time. Never mind full time. But it does seem that even from Thiago's point of view, it's not just the creativity from midfield assisting the assister, as it were. He's actually getting into the box and he's actually getting himself on the end of opportunities. Yeah, well, that's that's massive for him because you know. If you look at his time with Bayern Munich, he kind of always played in the six. The times when Kimmich played midfield, he was always the deep lying one who was able to get on the ball off the center, you know, get the ball off the center half, look to kind of start the attacks. Yesterday, we kind of seen him given kind of a, almost a free license to get forward because when you have someone like Fabinho sitting behind you, he does allow you to get forward. You look at, you know, Mane's goal or whatever. Um, like he's he's up in the box receiving the ball. Look, we, we know he's a special player. There's never. There's never been a question of his, you know, technical ability. At times, yes, the way the, you know, the Premier League is played, his positioning has been questioned, or, you know, probably his his inability to tackle. He's not the best tackler, but all round in terms of passing, uh, control, all that, he's an exceptional player, and that, that will only benefit Liverpool. Obviously, coming into the Premier League, he suffered that injury um, against Everton, so he took a lot of time to get going. And if you've seen a lot of Jurgen Klopp signings are probably Alisson and Van Dijk. Some of them have taken probably six to nine months to really get going. Even if you look at, say, Robertson, when he signed, it wasn't, you know, three, four months until he was kind of established in the team and was getting a run of games. Thiago probably needed, you know, to filter in and out of the team, get a good preseason under his belt. And now, like, you can see from his performance yesterday that he's, you know, really excelling. Uh, the front three, as it started yesterday, was Sadio Mane, Diogo Jota and Mohamed Salah. Uh, that trio I know Firmino was like underappreciated by everybody and all that kind of stuff and those conversations that we've had about him before but mm. the quality of movement that you get and the added goal threat you get from Jada suggests that it looks like those those three could be even better than 
the previous iteration when it was uh, Firmino in, in the middle, um, which again would give Liverpool fans confidence that this, this is going to be a, a team that can sustain a title challenge, I guess. Oh, of course. Look, I've cried out many a time that I would love Liverpool to sign someone to kind of, you know, push the front three. And I think Jota can do that. Um, that's why if you look at Manchester United, Chelsea, you know, Chelsea go and win the Champions League and they spend 100 million on Lukaku. You know, that kind of, you know, you need that. Manchester United go and sign Ronaldo, Sancho. They want to push players on. Liverpool, of course, haven't done that. But Jota is that one that could probably play in all three of those four positions. So he's able to, you know, Jurgen has a great choice now that does he play Firmino and does he, you know, or does he start Jota? Does he give Mane a rest? Does he give Salah a rest? Because Jota, look, you see the impact he had last season before the injury where he was scoring all the time. That's huge. And look, he does have a goal threat. He's always sniffing around. And if he can keep adding goals, like there's always been a question mark over, you know, Bobby Firmino's, you know, his goals tally. He doesn't score enough goals. Yes, his all-around game is superb, but we want more goals from him. Um, but certainly with Jota, adds a different dimension. They do interlink well. They do move well. There's a nice little bit of rotation with them. Um, so it is, look, it's, it's, it's great for Jorgen to have that, you know, decision to make week in, week out. Is Joel Matip the starter now? He obviously very important in creating the, the opening for the first goal and it seems like, you know, uh, the, the manager likes partnerships, likes a settled team. In some ways, it, it looks like it might be a long time before we see Kanata getting a start. I think it will be. Um, like, if you, if you remember back, obviously we're probably talking about two seasons ago when Joe Gomez really came onto the scene. It was when, you know, Matip got injured. Um, Joe came in and then he was superb, picked up a, a slight knock and then Matip came back in again um, towards like, probably towards the back end of the Champions League. Um, and it looked like kind of that was Jorgen's main too. Again, then the biggest problem or biggest concern you'd have over Matip is he does pick up a lot of injuries. Um, so like, that was the big thing. Obviously last year, look, it's been talked about enough times about uh, Liverpool's central, central defending pair being all over the place with injuries. So they sign Kanate, you're going to have to wait. Like, I don't think it's quite easy as as a player. I think when, you know, the team is winning and the centre-halves are doing well, that you can kind of accept where you're at, um, that you can kind of say, look, I know we're all desperate to play, but you kind of, if, if the team are winning and doing well, and Matip and, Go, uh, Matip, sorry, and Van Dijk are doing really well, so I think Gomez and Kanate have to be patient. But there will be opportunities, but I think they are his main too. AC Milan on Wednesday then, are we, are we going to see... Van Dijk play all these games? I think so. Um, I, I, I don't think you can rest Virgil. You've just seen the impact he's had, you know, since he's been back from his injury. He is just a breath of fresh air. Like, the, obviously, the game against Chelsea, how he dealt with Lukaku, um, that was obviously the big question mark. I know, obviously, Chelsea went down to 10 men, which kind of ruined the game. But certainly in the fact that, you know, he, he's just... He never looks phased and he never looks overstretched in terms of, you know, a difficult game. It always seems easy for him. And that's what the best players do. Um, I imagine we'll get on to Ronaldo at some stage, but mm. that, the best players do that. And I think Virgil will be certainly one of those. He'll have played all the international games straight back in. He'll just want to, you know, keep continuing playing games. He won't want to break that flow and he'll want to stay in the team. But I suppose it, there will be times when probably in the Champions League or FA Cup, League Cup, and when they come around that, there will probably be an opportunity to give them a rest. But in terms of like your opening game at Champions League and say AC Milan at home, you want to win. Um, you need your best players on the pitch. And, you know, Van Dijk is certainly one of Liverpool's best players. Well, let's talk about Ronaldo then. I mean, uh, a perfect second debut for uh -huh. him with his, with his two goals. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better opportunity with the, the, first, op with the first chance he gets and, and buries it to, to get back up and running. Is this... Like, I'm not sure what your take on Manchester United was with regards to them being proper title challengers before Saturday, but has it transformed that view? Well, before before Ronaldo signed, um, obviously the three key areas you were looking at were the right winger. Um, like, I'm a, I'm a huge Mason Greenwood fan, but I think in the long run, he'll become a striker. So you, you kind of had Mason and Daniel James playing on the right-hand side. Um, the other position was centre-half. I felt Harry Maguire needed a better partner um, than Victor Lindelof. Obviously, you sign Rafa Varane, um, which is huge, like a four-time Champions League winner, World Cup winner. I, I, I still can't wrap my head around people have question marks about him. Would he be able to adapt to the Premier League? Um, the other position is midfield, which I think is United's biggest 
biggest concern. Um, they're crying out for a holding midfielder. If you look at, we just spoke about Liverpool. If you look at, they have Fabinho, and as a backup, they've got Henderson and Thiago. Um, you look at Chelsea, they've got Jorginho, Kante. Um, you know, you look at Manchester City, they've got Fernandinho and Rodri. There's players there that are at a certain level, and I just feel that. You know, Matic has been superb for a long time, but he's at the back end. Um, and then you, you've got Fred McTominay. I think, you know, Scott McTominay's a young boy who will go on and have a marvellous career. But I just feel where United are now, they need they need a world-class number six so that they can allow your Pogba, you know, to get forward. Look, he's seven assists in four games, which is remarkable. And then, obviously, Bruno is... Know, the Maverick in that side um, as a 10, but they just need that outright crying six. Are they title challengers? They have to be. Um, I think, you know, the signing of Ronaldo will lift them all, you know, whether it be 5 10%. I think he takes them on a level. You just seen the, you know, the other day, his ability to sniff out chances, goals. Like, it's a great example if you look at the first one as Mason takes the shot and the keeper saves it. Ronaldo's the only one following in. Um, he's just got that movement. He's got that sense of awareness of where the ball is going to drop. He just finds himself in the right positions. I like to think he's, you know, 36. I think it's his 787 goal he scored in his career. It's just remarkable um, what the fellas is able to achieve. And there's no doubting he'll score many goals for United this season. We've obviously seen the rest of the uh, top four, the big four win and begin to establish a little bit of daylight already this early in the season. That's kind of what we expect, right? That there are going to be routine three no wins for Chelsea against teams like Villa. Maybe, maybe City were um, a little less uh, impressive at the weekend, but they're still they're still getting back to form and they're still winning games. So that top four is established, and that's if any of them aren't actually title challengers this year, it's a bad season for them. Definitely, like you look at those four sides, they are the top four. Um, like I genuinely do believe I was on with Joe. Uh, before the season started. I do believe that this title race will be very close. I think the four of them will be within, I'm going to say, like 10 points of one another. I, th- I really do believe that they'll they'll annihilate all the other 16 teams. Um, look, there'll be points dropped here and there. Um, and it will basically come down to who, you know, who beats who. Um, I genuinely believe the four squads, like Liverpool are probably the only squad that hasn't, really kicked on. Of course, look, there's a lot of players that have signed new long, long-term long contracts, which is great. But, like, United have freshened it up. City have freshened it up. Chelsea have freshened it up. So I, I do believe this will be one of the most exciting years. And if the four of them, you know, keep going the way they look like they're going to go, um, it should be a really fascinating year. Um, I'm very cynical and, and did not believe Daniel Fark during the week when he was saying, yeah, I was watching the international uh, break and, geez, uh, Andrew Amavandelli was really good. And maybe we're going to have to look at putting him in the team. I was like, ah, oh, look, that sounds like the type of patronising stuff that managers always come out about their players. And then lo and behold, the team is mm-hmm. named. Norwich are tweeting out a picture of his jersey about him making his uh, full Premier League debut. And it was um, exactly what you would want. It was up against Aubameyang and up against Arsenal and kept him at bay for like 60-odd minutes, only conceded once and has the full 90 minutes under his belt. It's um, It's been a whirlwind for him, but he's exactly where he needs to be and we should be really proud of the fact that this guy looks like he is the real deal. 100%. Look, Andrew's performance, you know, against Portugal um, and again then against Serbia, you know what I mean? He's really come on leaps and bones. Obviously, he'd been relatively unknown to a lot of people, um, but certainly, you know, to see his performance against Serbia, you know, taking the ball out, playing out from the back. Like the biggest thing after, you're kind of saying, I hope he goes back to his club and plays, which will only benefit one, him, two, you know, Stephen. And like you said, look, a lot of managers do take interest in international football. Um, Obviously, there's that concern that, you know, a player might pick up an injury, but they do watch games. They want to know how their players are getting on. Of course, for Daniel Fark, we've got Andrew and we've got Adam. So there's two players. So it's a bit like, you know, a bit more of an interest for him. Um, but to see that performance and then obviously talk him up and then bring him straight into the side um, is only is only really good. Obviously, going away to Arsenal is always going to be, you know, a tough one. But like it's 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 incredible uh, what a week it's been for the young fella. Um, do you know what I mean? And it's fantastic for for him, his family, and of course Irish football. Um, you know, we 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 have this great knack of producing great centre halves. Obviously, 
the loss of Darrow Shea was was a disaster against Portugal. But then you, you're thinking who's going to come in and replace him? And all and hold, Andrew steps in and he's made it look like Dar has not been there and he's been you know in the squad for years. That's a really big plus. So we just want to see him kick on, keep you know continue to play for Norwich and hopefully he gets. You know, just keeps getting better and better. He's got a real chance of making it as well because he can step up and he's got a range of passing. It's everything that you need from a modern centre-back in the Premier League. And so the more Norwich play him, I mean, look, obviously Norwich want to keep him for 10 years and they want him to have a full possible oh, career there. But <laughs> yeah. like when you have an 18-year-old who's playing international football and also playing in the Premier League, there's going to be interest from the bigger clubs as well. So the more they play him, the better and more valuable the asset becomes. Definitely. Um, that's that's look. That's part and parcel of football. It is a business. Of course, Norwich would like to keep him for the entire, you know, his entire career because he'll only benefit them. Um, but I think at the moment, just leave him play, leave him enjoy it. You know, if he gets, so we four games into the season. Um, if he gets thirty plus games in the Premier League, it'll only be a huge vote of confidence from one the manager. Uh, two, he'll you know keep developing as you said. He'll keep getting better. He'll be able to you know get that experience under him. Keeps continue to play for Stephen, um, which will be massive. And we've got another fantastic centre half on our hands. So all good for Irish football. 100%. Great to have you back, David. Thanks a million. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Thank you. David Moyer giving us some thoughts there on the weekend's Premier League action. OTBA and brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. It's 8.55 this morning. We're going to be talking with the uh, winning captain from the Galway Camogie team that yesterday won the All-Ireland Final against Cork and we also are going to um, update you on our training for our duathlon which is coming up in a very short three and a half weeks time. <laughs> How's it going? Well, well, we'll, t- we'll tell everyone later I guess. I had the, I had the All-Ireland Final r- marked off as like the, the end of my non-training so the training officially starts this week. Plenty of time. Uh, you've That's got, how it works, isn't it? You've got, you've got good reserves of uh, pulling things out um, out of nowhere. So, Well, we had like eight weeks to do it last year. It's only four weeks to do it this year. So, I mean, you've got, the, you've got the training in the bank from last year. Half the time. Makes sense. Um, does lying on the couch eating peanuts and drinking wine count as... Um, that does. Wine is good for you. Banked. As long as you're not like... As long as you're not slamming Dutch gold. As long as it's wine. You know, you've, you've picked a healthy option. <laughs> Uh, okay, we were turning our back to the uh, All Ireland Football Final, and I am delighted to say that Niall Morgan is with us this morning. Niall, how are you? <laughs> Not too bad. Great. <laughs> What's it been like? What 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 happened immediately afterwards, and then what was the homecoming like last night? Then, uh, well, immediately after, obviously there was the the massive sense of relief, and I always wondered how I'd react whenever the final whistle went in All Ireland. That if if we ever got to win, and I know in eighteen it was serious disappointment but uh, just utter relief and um, then we had our we obviously had plenty of celebrations on the pitch and stuff and chain rooms and we had a banquet in our mass city hotel on saturday night which was great because uh, it was it was more closed than in 18 it was more just family and friends and um the the actual drone setup i suppose and it was a bit more intimate i suppose and people who have also made commitments throughout the year and sacrifices so it's great to celebrate with them rather than you know in 18 there's a lot of empty tables put it like that uh, that that would have been full had we won um and then the homecoming yesterday we were in Oma and it was an absolute huge crowd and then we went to the east side of throne as well to claim potty hampsey's hometown and it was just mental it was the the turnout in both places was huge and just it's so surreal what's what's been done the last sort of day and a half it's probably going to be surreal for a while while you um look back on a totally remarkable season all of the different teams that you had to overcome and the quality of footballers that you've beaten and coming through the whole covid stuff so like it, it might take you all a while to process exactly what's happened yeah, well, if I have to think about this every single day for until the the first game of next year, I think I'll be happy enough. So, uh, although we're back in the, we're told we have club club games now next Sunday. Uh, we have to we have to finish a league out that has eight games still left in it and at least five weeks of championship. So I think it takes us up to about the <laughs> right eighteenth of December or so. So it'll be <laughs> it could be a long enough year still to go. Do you do more running for your club or for the Tyrone County team, given your uh, goalkeeper for one and outfield player for the other? 
<laughs> I think I'd do more running for Tron, even though I play outfield for the club. Uh, they'll probably say that as well. Uh, you, you mentioned there that you, you've always wondered what uh, happens at the full-time whistle, and you mentioned that it's pure relief. Do, do you remember exactly who you run to? You're, you're, you're the first person you see, the first person you hug at the full-time whistle? Uh, I, I never really thought about who, who I'd run to or anything. I suppose you always just think I'd be the closest person, but end up I just folded myself up like a wee baby and started to cry. <laughs> Uh, it was just utter utter relief, and the the feeling was just so good. Uh, I think Petey Hart was the first in the scene then, and maybe McNamee and McKeon and Hampsey, and around the back line, and then just everybody was in the pitch, and it was just great to see the happiness and joy that it brought to everybody's face, and the the commitments that have been made by everybody throughout the year, through lockdown, training individually. You know, we we were really rigid in the rules and. It's just amazing to, for to come out this side of it um, and get our just rewards. Does it get spoken about at the start of the season, Niall, the possibility of winning the All Ireland? Yeah, I think I think every team realistically would be speaking about it. Uh, I've always said that unless I felt drunk with an All Ireland, I wouldn't I wouldn't play because the sacrifices are just too high, um, especially of a young family now and. Uh, so it was. It's talked about at the start of the year as like an end goal, but then it's it's put the back burner, and you just take game at a time. I know that sounds very cliche, but that's the way it goes. And I'd say it's the same in every county. Everybody sets out that goal of winning their provincial, and then you know going on to compete in all Ireland. But I suppose with Dublin standings over the last few years and how how good Kerry were last last year, and I suppose they got caught caught cold by Cork and in, in Munster, but. Um, everybody was sort of talking about them too and how that was going to be the dream final and then for us to upset Kerry and Mayo to upset Dublin in the semi-finals I think it just set up for a great final and I think it was a very good match So was so that motivation for you looking at people saying that that's the dream final looking at people jumping to conclusions about what the All-Ireland final might be? Yeah well I suppose being from Throne you know Throne weren't used to being in All-Ireland finals or anything until the noddies and then we got a wee bit uh, complacent and I suppose thought they were just going to come along all the time and then it took 10 years between 08 and 18 to get to a final. Then we were beaten and you were sort of thinking, I know like myself as an older player, thinking if you'd ever have the chance to get into another one. So um, I suppose it does give you a wee bit of added motivation and then we in turn, I suppose, maybe, maybe we, we enjoy it but we, we feel like we're always written off as you know, a team that isn't good enough and now that we don't have Peter Canavan playing for the team anymore, it's like he hasn't been for the last uh, 15 years or so, that, uh, that we'll never be good enough to compete. And uh, I think that's the best thing about our squad this year. Like, we didn't have, like, that out-and-out -out standout player that everybody wants to have in their team. And uh, we just had a team of... Uh, the, the, a collective that, that really wanted to do it for each other and really has that respect and for each other and it's just it's just amazing to come out this side of it with uh, with an All-Ireland that nobody can ever take back. When the final whistle goes and, and you're wrapped up in the fetal position essentially wh <laughs> what are you thinking about? Uh, for me personally and I've thought about it a lot this week and even in the lead up to 18 whenever I was younger I made a promise to my dad after Tron got beaten in a backdoor game and he was distraught and I didn't really know what was going on but or the the magnitude of the situation. I made a promise to him that we that I would win all Ireland someday for him, and you know to be able to fulfil that promise was just amazing. And then to be, you know, to have my young children there and to have Christy on the pitch after was just um, great because it it gives him something to look back on, and whenever he's old enough to understand, and hopefully it. You're, you're a role model for him to want to do the same. So it wasn't just that you'd won in the moment, it was that you were fulfilling this promise that you'd made as a kid to your dad. It's, it's kind of, it's, I guess that's the whole thing, isn't it? That no individual victory is won in the moment. It's won on the back of a lifetime of love of the sport, first off, and then the commitment that you make as you go along, and then overcoming all the obstacles that you've had to overcome on the way too. Yeah, definitely. I've been playing Gaelic from when I was maybe three or four years of age. Dad had me, he was a big coach, well, big into the coaching in the club, the youth coaching. And um, like, Dad wouldn't have been 
a, a great footballer. He wouldn't have played much senior football or anything to the club. So um, he held me up from a young age, and I suppose like all them years of putting in practice with with Eden Dark and uh, to finally ful- fulfil you know ev- everything that you've ever uh, sacrificed and. It's just, it's just amazing. It's so hard to put into words how, how to describe how you feel. The other thing, Niall, is that you've been a risk taker along the way. That, um, you know, when when you're coming out of goals and you're soloing the ball, you can hear the crowd. They're, like everybody can hear the crowd going, "What? What? What's going on here? <laughs> oh!" And you have to ignore that. And you've managed to ignore that for the best part of a decade, to a point where. Uh, it's now normalised that you're in the half back line or in midfield, pinging balls, pinging through balls through for McCurry to run onto and nearly score goals from. That evolution and that process, it's a remarkable journey to go on because we know that Irish people are innately conservative when it comes to innovators in sport in particular. We're suspicious of them. We, we're, we don't get behind them and go, yeah, you go and you be you. It's like, what the hell are you doing? So there's a bit of, I presume there's a bit of relief in all that coming to fruition too at the end. Yeah, big time. Um, whenever I started out playing for the club in 2008, I played outfield for the first few games and then uh, they moved me back into goals and they sort of played me in a bit of a sweeper role at that stage. Now, I'd have been playing more nearly man marking the full forward and the full back would have played out in front. Whereas with throwing that, it's a wee bit different. And uh, Mickey sort of gave me the license to go and do it and, and try it out and uh, played it for the club a couple of years ago as well, whenever the our goalkeeper was in Scotland at university. And then Fergal and Brian came in this year and they were, were happy for me to do the same. Now they did sort of say at the start maybe not to not to go as much. Um but uh, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. We got caught in Kerry a few times in Killarney in the in the league. Uh, got lobbed in the first half and then then it's well you're gonna take the risk again. But to me, it, it pays off. I've, I've cut out a number of balls in the last couple of seasons. Uh, and then the one at the weekend that nearly led to Darren's goal in the first half. But again, the first half, only for Ron McNamee's block, I was well off. Uh, my line is scrambling back whenever O'Shea took the shot, so it could have been very, very different. Well, what's really interesting, Niall, is that you've been part of this group of goalkeepers that have brought the position to, to a whole new level. But with that has come a whole new level of profile as well, that this generation of goalkeepers are just more notable than, than previous goalkeepers in terms of in terms of their name and, and fame and all that. And like even if you go back to your first championship season in, in 2013, I think most people will remember that, that game in Ballybofay where you maybe miss a few frees here and there and it's a, it's a tough day for you. I think you're, you're cupping your ears to the crowd and all that. But you seem to embrace being in the spotlight in that moment. You didn't shy away from it. You continued to take the freeze. You continued to take risks. And you pushed the boat out even further this year. I presume that takes a whole pile yeah, of mental definitely. toughness. And what goes through your head? Yeah, I think like like everybody, I have myself doubts as well. And that game in Bally Buffet that year was just a horrendous experience and you know but it was something that that made me learn that I have to sort of you know yes focus on the game and take risks as as they come but I reacted to the crowd that day like and that shouldn't have happened um but like a lot of people would talk about me bottling big kicks and big games and you know um I've missed a lot of kicks to either equalize or win matches but you know I've always said that if somebody puts her hand up and asks me to come up and, and take it, I'll, I'll always give it my best. And sometimes it comes off and sometimes it doesn't. And thankfully on on Saturday, you know, we kicked three from three, which was a big thing for me because to do that in an All-Iron final, that's the biggest stage um, to not miss. And for kickouts to go well, apart from the, the very first one, it's a, you, you do have self-doubt and it's, it's nice to, you know, prove to yourself more than anybody else that, the commitment and sacrifice is all worth it because pe- people have doubted me from from that first year and people have questioned my mental toughness and uh, said that I'm flaky and you know that I can be got at and I've heard it from other county players of different teams saying that that I would be targeted by them in, in games because they feel like if they press me and there was articles after the Kerry game saying that my kickouts malfunctioned and you know it's just I just thought that was a uh, 
I thought it was kind of funny in a way because like I'd done literally what I was told and that was get the ball long and play the ball in Kerry's half and every one of my kickouts went exactly where I wanted it to go and um, unfortunately it's not up to me to be, be up there to get the break ball as well but sometimes you just have to do what you're told and I, I'm glad that I did and yes I had the horrible kick out of my hands in, in the second half which put us under pressure and it nearly led to a carry goal but to, to be judged as a as a goalkeeper for miss hitting a kick out of your hands uh, whenever you're trying to get the ball from your own 45 into the forward line, I thought it was a bit, it was a bit uh, funny, as I say. So, uh, look, I'm more than happy to, to take the, the criticism as it comes and take uh, the praise with a pinch of salt and know that it's the, the great saying of you're only a pat in the back's only a few inches away from a kick in the ass. So, uh, it's... It's it's just great to to finally get over the line. How do you manage to use that to th- those criticisms as motivation for yourself? Because a lot of people with a thinner skin than you would allow it to affect to affect them in a negative way. So, are you talking to people in the camp? Or are you are you bouncing these ideas or are these articles off people? And are you getting positive feedback from them, which allows your own confidence to subsequently grow? Uh, the the throne camp this year is just. You know, it's so it's so personable and that they can nearly sense whenever you're in bad form or whenever you do need to pick me up and you know, I've been pulled aside a few different times and just probably told what I needed to hear, uh, without even having to go and seek it out. And you know, at the same time I've been told a few home truths throughout the year as well, which I need to be told at the right times as well. Uh, but I remember seeing a quote, uh, I'm not big well, I, I like seeing different quotes and stuff, but I'm not big into them. Uh, but it just said about pro- proving to yourself rather than proving to others and, you know, prove yourself right. You know, all I want to do is prove myself right that, you know, all my sacrifices, walking out of the ha- home house here and leaving two children behind three or four times a week is, is worth it rather than, you know, I'm not going to start name dropping people and say that I'm pr- proving him wrong or him wrong. It, it, it just doesn't. You know, I couldn't care what they think of me, and I think people are starting to understand that that I'm a m- my own person. And you know, if if you like me, great. If you don't like me, you know, I don't really care because I'm not going to go out trying to please you or to, to prove anything to you. It's 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 about proving myself right and proving, uh, I suppose, to Fergal and Brian that their faith in me uh, is warranted. How did you guys keep going then? You know, you talked about losing the All Ireland final before. You've lost All All Ireland semi finals before. What was it that gave you the belief? You know, you said earlier on, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't think we were going to be able to win in All Ireland. Why did you keep going after those dark days? Do you think? I just always felt that there was there was more in the team, and uh, I think if you look at a lot of the games, there, there was always that moment in the game that that turned it against us. Um, and a lot of the time it was out of our own doing. In the 18 final, we were well ahead. Um, we sort of switched off before half time. I had a bad kick out, led to the penalty. And it sort of everything turned on that. In the, the, the 2015 semi final, there was the goal chance, t- two goal chances in the game that we didn't take. In 19, it was, you know, the carry breaking from, from their own half and getting the goal. and. In, in uh, 17, obviously, Dublin demolished us in the semi-final and I suppose that was the hardest year to come back from because you were thinking, like, we are so far behind Dublin, it's crazy. But uh, I just always had that belief and I suppose maybe that promise to, to my dad was always ringing in my head and I didn't want to be seen as a quitter and somebody who gave up uh, on a dream just because uh, they felt they were a wee bit behind. It would have been very easy for me to go back to the soccer with a lot of teams in the Irish League contacting me each year to to go back but like yeah I, have that, I had that dream as a child that I wanted to win all Ireland and I made that promise and I suppose I really wanted to fulfil it and and now you have can I, you, you mentioned the, the Kerry game and it, it keeps coming up actually in the aftermath of uh, of all of the interviews that everybody's done since you've won everybody talked about the, the Kerry game in the league um, what changed? What what specifically do you think changed after that? Was there a, a, a shift in tactics? Were you trying something specific that day? Were there mad training sessions on the morning of the game? All the conspiracy theories are out there, Niall. No, we, we definitely didn't train the morning of the game. That's That was a mad statement to come out with. I think that was somebody maybe trying to cover for how bad we were. 
uh, whenever we arrived down the Friday night, we went to the, the National Park for basically a stretch. We were on a bus for seven hours and we went and got the footballs out and had done a bit of fist passing and we we had our we had our boots on, but it was literally if if we I'd say the walk from the bus to the to the grass patch that we used was was more than any distance that we we covered uh, on the grass. Um but it was just maybe a wee bit of naivety from ourselves. We sort of went down and we had a we had done all right in the, the three games against the Ulster teams and everybody was talking up Kerry and we sort of thought, look, we'll just we'll go down here and we we'll give them a game and you know, we did believe that we could beat them, but now that was a day of the kick out malfunction. Uh, if you if you want to go go and see a kick out malfunction, uh, we got absolutely wiped. We tried to go short, they pressed us. Uh, then we tried to go long, and we couldn't get bodies near breaks. And uh, we just we played into Kerry's hands so much that day. And I think whenever it came to back to training on the Tuesday night, uh, there was a lot of home truths, and boys just had to take it in the chin and. And realise the the deficiencies that we had, and we we worked really hard in the in training then in the the lead up to the Ulster Championship, and uh, thankfully it, it paid off in them games. Like you know, we, we beat the the reigning Ulster champions on the first day. We beat Danny Gall, who we've really struggled against in, in Ulster Championship in recent years, and then we beat Monaghan, who we've also struggled against in Ulster Championship. So it was a it was a massive. Uh, it was a massive Ulster Championship for us. Never mind to then turn around and beat Kerry and, and Mayo, who we have also struggled against big time in Championship. Like that was the first time I'd ever beat either of the two of them in a Championship game. So it's a uh, it's it's down to the hard work that the boys, especially like the outfielders, the work they put in uh, on a Tuesday and Thursday night is just it's mental just seeing them and like I'm going back to club now to, to mark some of them in, in, the, in the coming weeks and just thinking how you know it's it's one thing whenever you're jogging about and you go on a wee run up the pitch every now and again but to have to turn around and mark one of these boys now in the next couple of weeks is, they have is to take it be... easy on you though because you're very you're very important for them next year if they want to win another All-Ireland so just just point that out at first first few minutes <laughs> It's own club football. <laughs> it's a, it's a whole different game. Yeah. Uh, even if we had a game uh, in a fortnight's time, they would still be cutting lumps out of each other next Sunday. So it's a, it's very parochial. It's it's very competitive. We have a knockout championship up here, straight knockout. So you only get one chance, and it's just it's hell for leather from the start. And I think there's a few games on TV last year give people an insight into what club football yeah. is like in Toronto. Yeah, well, really high quality, like very skillful and incredibly intense. Can I just ask about the McCurry goal? Are you picking out Con Kilpatrick with that kick out, or does it just happen to be you know you you can back him in a fifty fifty? Is that are you specifically aiming at him? I suppose is my question. Yeah, well, like obviously, I, me, Con, and Darren are the same club, and I know what Con's capable of, and uh, he had sort of said to me and uh, before the game that. He, he fancied his chances in the air and if I needed a, a go-to kick out just put it on top of him and uh, it might have sounded a wee bit uh, cocky of him like, but uh, I see him doing it week in week out for the club and uh, I suppose I just seen that we need the kick out to go long and he was the, the longest option and I just sent it down top of him I was sort of more thinking if even if we can pick up a break ball because Mayo were, were rightly pushed up at that stage that we, we might get a bit of a counter and you know, he got up and he caught it, um, caught it clean, had the awareness to dish it off really quickly. And then I don't even know how Connor seen Darren because he, uh, I haven't watched it back fully yet, but I don't even think he looks at him. And no. He plays the perfect pass. And, you know, that's that's something that Connor McKenna brings to us because he's done it in training on a number of occasions. Even like I've went in a few forays up the pitch in training and he's picked me out with passes whenever I think that he, he hasn't even seen me. Um, and I suppose maybe it's coming from the the AFL where he's got more bodies around him and you know a different style of tackling. He has to be more aware of getting the ball out of difficult situations. But uh, you know a lot of people maybe expected Connor to come back and hit one six one seven every game, but he's been absolutely unbelievable. His work rate, his tracking back, he's great out ball for me for kickouts and you know that vision again. As I say, is just it's class and the two goals in the the semi final as well just sort of summed him up as well. Uh, in the middle of the um, COVID stuff that was going on, was there any part of you that was concerned that actually the game mightn't go ahead and that could be the end of your season? Yeah, we we made the call after training on the 
the basically the day that came out that we were going to pull out, and we, we had a real tough training session. And then Fergal and Brian pulled us in after and said that basically that that was it. They they made the call based on the health guidelines that or the health guidance, sorry, that they, they'd received from uh, top end uh, medical officer in Dublin that you know the team would not, definitely not be fit to play the next week, and I suppose we just had to. We had to go with it. We we, we did have a, a tough discussion for ten or fifteen minutes over it. Boys given uh, different points of view on it, and some boys still wanted to play. But we made the decision that if we were going to do this, we we're going to do it together. And uh, like if we had went down the following week, we would have maybe had you know twenty fit players. If if that like you know, and then you were taking you're going to have to take risks on boys that had got uh, COVID in the the week leading up to it, and it just. You know, it is, a, it is a pandemic. It is a health emergency at the end of the day. And we have had our tragedies up here the same way everybody else has. So it was it was kind of disappointing the way people called us out as if, you know, we were trying to cheat the system. You know, we we it did work out in our favour in the end. But, you know, Crook Park had the right to turn around and say, well, look, if you're pulling out, you're pulling out. It was it was them that gave us the, the lifeline and the extra game. And to be fair to Kerry coming out as well and saying they were willing to play. So... Uh, we we made a very tough call and thankfully it, it turned around and worked in our favour. There was a, a short period of time. It, was, it wasn't it wasn't insignificant though, where you're officially out of the championship saying we can't play. It's it's back to Croke Park now, and you're waiting for for that hearing. What's the feeling in the pit of your stomach at that point? Are you confident that actually the right thing will be done, or is there a fear that like Jesus, this could be it? Well, we we knew it was the right thing to do for a start, and. Um, you know, sometimes in life you have to stand up and, and you know, say that what we're doing is the right thing to do. And um, I'm a big believer in stand up for yourself and stand up for what you believe. Um, and, you know, we took that stance and it was a hard stance to take. And, you know, you you knew that you were going to be questioned throughout the county. Like if, if and the country, you knew if, if Croke Park had to turn around and give Kerry a a buy into the final that you were you were taking away probably the integrity of the competition, but it was a it was a stance we had to take, and it, it definitely was the right one. And you know, yes, there was a relief when we got back in, but there was many club managers uh, sending text messages asking when when we were going to be at training. So <laughs> uh, yeah, I think some of them were happy enough uh, if it, if it had been pulled. Always um, priorities but, when it comes to the club managers, right? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you know yourself what it's like. So see you next week. Um, uh, yeah, well, they were uh, that we had made that statement on the Saturday, and I think some clubs asked for their players to be there on a Sunday morning. Believe it or not. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, Fergal, Fergal made it quite clear that you know if we're taking the stance, you're not, you're not available for your club. Yeah, fair enough. And, <laughs> you can't play. For no the point. We, we can't play a game next next weekend, and then everybody go return to play for their club. So um, <laughs> that, that would have been good crack trying to tell the club managers, yeah, we're out of the championship now, but now we're not going to bother coming to train and play for you next weekend. And in a weird way, Niall, you said that there was a you know tense 10, 15 minute conversation there where the management have decided this and they're breaking the news to the players, and some of the players are like, no, 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 we're going to go. And in a weird way, having that conversation, like it has to be intense because. As you've talked about, you're leaving your family, your young kids, you know, three, four times a week to go and do this thing. And then management have said, actually, you know, we've got we've got science now that says we don't think we're going to be able to do ourselves justice. Being able to have that afterwards to look back on where everybody was given the opportunity to say what they thought, that gives a great sense of unity and purpose, I, I suppose, that there was an honesty in the room where that strength of feeling emerges. Definitely. I, I think I mentioned that earlier about how honest the setup has been in terms of, you know, calling a spade a spade if boys needed to toll things. Uh, the management weren't afraid to to call them out and it didn't matter whether you were the, I suppose, the, the more senior experienced players like myself or Matty or PD, right down to the, the new lads and the team, the, ma- the management treated everybody exactly the same. And I think, you know, it would have been very easy for them to pull like a, a small leadership group or even just Kieran and Potty as vice captain and captain into a, a room and let them go and break it to the players and not give us a say. But uh, we were in a huddle, the the whole background team, the management team, the players, we were all there. And um, there was boys started off sitting on the grass just thinking that it was going to be the normal end of training uh, team talk. And 
then there was a few of them started standing up and stepping forward a wee bit more uh, keenly and sort of they had their say and you know but at the end of the day it, it came down to being about the team and being about everybody rather than individuals looking their day out in Croke Park and everybody uh, bought into it and was happy that that was the decision that was being made and that was the way it was going to go and don't get me wrong Fergal and Brian did offer the chance and said look if if it's really strongly felt in here that that you want to go and play with what we've got you know we'll go with that decision as well but we made the agreement that it just wouldn't be worth it with you know you you were going down you weren't going to do yourself justice you were probably going to have to call in boys who weren't even part of the panel to uh, take part and you know we've seen some people saying surely there's t- there's 20 players in throne they can play like but you know, we had, we had been down in Killarney weeks weeks before and with the full team and got an absolute annihilation and there would have been absolutely no point in going to Croke Park uh, with, with half a team or, or less and, and getting worse on this on a bigger stage. It's an incredible story, Not like even irrespective of the COVID aspect of it, but the bit where this team has come back under the new management team in their first season and played a style of football that was uh, capable of dealing with every single challenge and particularly the point you made about you know you haven't beaten those guys in, in the past in the championship it's a remarkable story you've been brilliant with your time this morning Niall you've had an incredible season I don't know are you has it sunk in just how good your own season has been yet you're in the, the conversation at least for Footballer of the Year you were in conversation for Man of the Match in an all Ireland final to reach that level at this stage of your career must be very fulfilling Definitely I think I alluded to it earlier that people have have doubted me the whole way through and there always is something to pick on me uh, about and it's just you know I might be playing the pity card there but that's sort of how it felt at times so you know to finally uh, prove that you know again to myself that everything's been worth it and uh, to be in in the conversation for player or man of the match and you know I know I'm well outside the, the bracket for footballer of the year but to be even uh, I'd, I'd mentioned with uh, my name in the same sentence is just unbelievable and I'm just I'm, I'm, it might sound silly but I'm delighted for myself that, that it finally has uh, all the sacrifices have, have you know came to fruition I suppose and the, the, the most important thing is the, that I've got a Celtic cross now and no matter what anybody says about me as an individual or about us as a team now, nobody can ever take that away from us. 2021 is going to be forever remembered as as Trone being All-Ireland champions and and that's that's all that matters to me and all that matters to all the team. It's in the books now, as you said. Nobody can ever take it away from you. Niall, thanks a million for joining us. No problem, thank you. And congratulations. It's uh, Niall Morgan there. Um, just a really interesting character, a really interesting part of... Gaelic football history now and you know everybody talks about how Cluxon changed the game but himself and Rory Began have taken that and they've run with it Cluxon was never really a sweeper keeper even though there's that one famous instance that we always talk about in the kick out against um, against Kerry and uh, you know when it's happening in club matches in Tyrone there's a petri dish of uh, high level thinking going on around Gaelic football particularly in the Ulster Football Championship and he was a sweeper keeper for his club in 2008. You know, when he's talking about it, it's, this is not a recent development. OTBAM is brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. Uh, Sarah Durvin is with us. She is the captain of the Galway All Ireland winning Camogie team. Another All Ireland winner. This is uh, a, a morning for luxuriating in glory. Sarah, how are you getting on this morning? Not too bad, guys. Not too bad. Um, delighted. Um, woke up with the biggest smile on my face this morning and to even hear Galway All Ireland champions and it's, it's a dream come true Where are you guys? Did you guys go straight home after the game last night? Was there a, a homecoming in Galway? No, no we stayed up um, just family and ourselves um, we stayed up in Dublin in the Carrollton Hotel Very good so the homecoming is today you've got all that to look forward to as well Can you just take us back to the game itself because um, you started really well and then Cork roared back and with a couple of minutes left to go, it's still in the melting pot, so you had to finish really strong. When when are you comfortable in the match? Is it literally at the full-time whistle where you're like, okay, that's over? Or um, I think it was, for me, it was seeing Owen McGrath put the ball over the bar at the 63rd minute. I think it was 63.05, and I was like, put us up three points, and I just said, we actually we have it. We actually have it. Um, and then the final whistle blew, and it was just, 
unbelievable, um, unbelievable scenes. Um, girls coming off the bench, running onto the pitch was just unreal. Um, but that was the moment I was. I finally went, okay, yeah, we have it. So the very last seconds, essentially. <laughs> You can never take it for granted. <laughs> no, no comfort in a game against a side who obviously are you know littered with All Ireland winners and who are coming, making it, getting back to the level that they were at when they were All Ireland champions. So you didn't have it easy. You didn't have it easy in the semi-finals either. It's been one of those years where you've had to fight for every single uh, success along the way, which I guess makes you better game after game after game. Is that right? Yeah, like I suppose we played Cork in the league and um, semi-final and. They brought us to extra time. And I suppose that day we kind of said, you know, as, as you said, never say die attitude. We just said we'd go and we we took the game to Cork and came out the right side of it. Then it kind of went into the championship then. Um, and we, it, the same thing kind of with Kikini. We bet Kikini in the dying seconds. There was a couple of goal um, opportunities that they didn't get. And, and that was down to the work rate of our girls and our forwards. And Aidan Ryan got a vital hook at the last second in that game for us to win it by a point and I suppose against Tip then they threw everything at us and we still stood firm and um, I, I think that all kind of stood to us in our mentality and when Cork got that goal you know it was all down to how we were going to react from that and thankfully we reacted so positively and you know we dug deep and we grounded out that win and got the next few scores which just sealed the deal for us. Sarah, Galway have obviously had their fair share of heartbreak when it comes to Camogie All-Ireland Finals. How much did that pain motivate you and how much does it make this all the sweeter this morning? Yeah, like, I have to say this is a sweet one, um, absolutely. You know, especially from last year, um, you know, like that, the game was in the melting pot until the 54th minute and there was a penalty then and the next thing the game was over and it was gone and the or Duffy was going to Kilkenny. And I suppose when we went back this year, our goal was to get back to an All-Ireland final. And, um, you know, we worked hard, we trained hard, and, you know, we hit the ground running then when the, when the ball was thrown in and it was just unbelievable. Um, amazing. And it's just such a great feeling to wake up this morning in the All-Ireland Champions. The the semi final performance was a bit patchy, and and I guess you came in for some criticism about the, whether or not you were getting back to the level that you'd need to be to win in All Ireland. And then the first ten minutes, five points on the board. So obviously, the importance of the start and making sure that the the good start was there, and the quality of play in that first ten minutes was a, a real sign that everybody was actually bringing their game face. What was the what was the dressing room like after the semi final? What were the the conversations like at training? between the semi-final and the final because you got through it which is obviously the sign of a good team but you definitely didn't play to your full potential in the semi No, definitely not and, and that was testament to Tip like they they worked hard they they turned over ball and they got a couple of goal chances and you know I suppose we just kind of knew that like Cork are a brilliant team and that performance wasn't going to cut it um, on an all-like final day so I suppose we just had to kind of take the positives from the game and know that we had to up our work rate and we had to work up our intensity and if we weren't then we weren't going to live with Cork and I suppose when the men's ball was thrown in we just focused on ourselves focused on our game and just brought an unbelievable want and hunger um, to win that ball back every time and that's, that's the way it worked out uh, There was a bit of controversy in the build up to the game and the Cork captain wasn't sure if um, they were going to get uh, her, if she was going to be allowed to play the DRA eventually at the last minute um, in essentially allowed the uh, suspension to be set aside and, and dealt with afterwards because of, there's a, just a glitch in the Camogie rule book uh, how do you how do you block out that because I know everybody always says oh that's something to do with us we've got to control the controllables but at the same time very important player in the opposition they name 14 they have 16 in the parade you know as mind games go it's uh, it's right up there. How do you block that out? And was it actually a successful? Were you successful at totally blocking it out? Yeah, like we knew obviously that what was going on in the background. Um, but like we wanted to focus on ourselves and we wanted to focus on what we could bring. And you know, if Orla got off or Doc got off, it didn't matter to us. Uh, what mattered to us was you know, fifteen players plus the twenty odd girls on the bench. What we could bring. 
and what we could, you know, attack the game with, and we play to our strengths, and that's what we focused on. Um, if she was playing, she was playing. If she wasn't, she wasn't. Um, and we couldn't control that, as you said. You can't, you know, control what you control. But we've just focused on ourselves, and you know, we let management. If they wanted to work on that, they they work on that. But as players, we blocked out the noise and we just focused on the game. What happens over the next little while then, Sarah? How does a, a homecoming work in, in the current circumstances? I don't know, to be honest. Um, Joel, I haven't heard any homecoming things yet. Um, I don't know what's going to happen, but look, we're just delighted. Like It's, it's hard to have a homecoming when you don't have the cup, but um, we're just unbelievably thrilled to be on the right side of things. And, you know, all our champions twice in three years is a brilliant achievement and I'm just so delighted and you know hugely proud of every one of the single girls out there and they've died with their boots on and you know it's just a testament to the work they've put in all year that we're on the right side of it do, do, do you appreciate this a little bit more considering you've been in the winner's enclosure in the past and you know exactly how quickly these moments can flitter away yeah like it's yeah, we really took this um, uh, win in. Um, I suppose, you know, dressing room match for match, when you lose in the Ireland final, it's a horrible place to be. And and it's hard to pick yourself up from that. But you, like, when you pack that and you move on to the next year, you would do everything you possibly can to make sure you're not in one of those dressing rooms again um, because they're so hard. And, like, our dressing room yesterday was just electric. Absolutely electric, and it's an unbelievable place to be in, and you wouldn't want to be anywhere in the world only in that dress room. Um, am I right in saying that you had to postpone your wedding twice last year, and uh, eventually it was ended up being one of the dates was around the time you got beaten in the All Ireland final? Uh, yeah, it was the week before. It. Um, ah, yeah. Look, it's unfortunately it's a situation we're in in the pandemic, but we'll get there eventually. Um, like you know, this winning this now does take the this thing out of postponing it that many times. But um, he's a very patient man. <laughs> twenty twenty was uh, crap, basically. Twenty twenty one is what you're all about. I, this, this, that's the. It's going to be a, not a bad year. It turns out, Sarah. Yeah, yeah, it's a fantastic year. Like, um, but yeah, looking forward to the big day now. And um, yeah, just look, it, like it, every couple, a load of couples have gone through what we've gone through, and it's just what it, it is, what it is. And you just look look forward to it. Um, and I can't wait to have a big day. Well, you can uh, bring the cup for the day. <laughs> yeah. and, and all the photographs as well. It'll look good. Uh, Sarah, <laughs> congratulations. Enjoy the homecoming. Thanks a million. Thanks. Thanks a million. Sarah Darwin there, uh, captain of the successful Galway Camogie team, which is now celebrating their second Ireland in three years. 9.37 this morning here on OTBAM, brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. Here's what we got with uh, OTB Sports Radio today. Uh, our gold interview at one o'clock is James McLean. At three o'clock, it's State of the Union with Keith Wood. The classic is uh, Champion, the documentary. OTB Gold is Declan Murphy, the jockey, uh, talking about his book called Centaur. And then the show will be live tonight from seven. We bring you more reaction to Tyrone and Galway's All Ireland title wins before 10 a.m. But up next this morning in OTB AM, we're talking about the OTB Whoop Duathlon. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Off the ball. And he also said to ask him about the Hummer golf buggy I saw him driving in Portugal. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the Hummer golf buggy, it wasn't mine, it was a friend of mine's. And uh, I uh, I rented his place and um, he had, that was his buggy to get about. So, yeah, it was interesting. I was trying to keep my head down at times, but it was, it should be. It was a little bit, yeah. Not sure what Rick Keane would have made of it. <laughs> Off the ball. Weeknights from 7 and weekends from 1. This is OTB Sports Radio. Live 24-7 on the OTB Sports app. Car insurance is boring, but you don't have to be. Get Set Go is the kind of car insurance you can sort in a few minutes online. Then bounce on with your day. Are you ready for quick start insurance? Get a quote now at getsetgo.ie. MCL Insurance Services Ireland Limited Trading is getsetgo.ie is regulated by the Central Bank of Ireland. OTB AM. With Gillette, put your best face forward with our new and improved razors. 
So, if you haven't heard this already, OTB Sports are doing another duathlon and it's all brought to you by Whoop, the digital fitness and health coach that provides personalised sleep, recovery and training insights. Check out whoop.com for more details and to chat through how our training has been going. Uh, I'm delighted to say Ronan is back with us and uh, Tommy is here as well, I think. Tommy, are you there? You are, yeah. Jerry, good morning. How are you? Hey, Ronan. Uh, Morning, lads. How's it going? Before we get to you, Ronan, um, Tommy, you're back with us now having officially secured intermediate status. Is that correct? Yeah, Mead Hill, we stayed up yesterday. Um, the lads put in a, a savage performance and we just about held off Sidden uh, with a with a few minutes to go. So uh, we're still in intermediate, a massive thing for our club. We were junior for 37 years, so we had no interest going back down there, Ger. You've um, obviously been part of the breakout uh, GA podcast, which has high level analysis going on week in, week out. And simultaneously to this, you've essentially been booted off the team. You, you're no longer a starter. <laughs> Oh, well, I don't know whether how much that had to do with it. Uh, my, my dodgy hamstrings may have had a wee bit to do with it too, but I'm not going to say I had a Cahill McShane-esque role. I absolutely did not yesterday. I, I barely touched the ball when I came in, but I got about 15 minutes. You want to see my heart rate stats for those 15 minutes I was on, Jared? I was struggling. Right. Uh, Ronan Jones, good morning to you. How are you? Good, Jared, and yourself? Yeah, good. We had you on last week, and it was just on the day that you were making a big announcement for Roop about the... Uh, the new band and the new uh, capabilities that it has. I'm going to give you 60 seconds now to tell us, uh, to give us a sales pitch for it. What, what's so special about the new one? Oh, brilliant, Jared, putting me on the spot. Uh, yeah, so obviously last week announced the, the Whoop 4.0. Um, and to be fair, I think it's probably the first time a lot of people actually heard of Whoop uh, at all. Um, so basically, the, the high level uh, OVO of Whoop on what we do. So we're a digital fitness and health coach. So we give you personalized insights across your sleep strain, recovery, uh, and then general health insights. The difference between the Whoop 3.0 and the 4.0 would be that I suppose that the 4.0 has a, a suite of new hardware updates, which we've been working on for a couple of years. Um, it has new features like a, a haptic smart alarm. So basically the strap on your wrist or on your wrist will, will wake you up at an optimal time in the morning. Um, so you don't have to set an alarm. We'll actually tell you when the, the optimal time for your body to wake up is, uh, and it will wake you up at that point. Adds a couple of new features that give you insights into your health, so not just you know looking at you know how do you optimize your sleep for your recovery, but actually just how do you track your baseline. So when you go to you know, your GP every six months, you can actually you know, print out a report uh, of your your resident heart rate, your HRV, and give it to them, and and just have this 24/7 monitoring tool. So not just looking at folks who are looking to optimize the performance, but those who are also looking to, to track their general health and wellness. I think the point about this, Ron, is that it works super well for the best athletes on the planet, but it also actually works well for people who have very short amounts of time to do some training. You know, anybody with a busy life, uh, this is actually going to help go. There's a window here every week that we can see in your data that actually if you were to do 15 minutes of activity or 30 minutes of activity, that would be the perfect time for you to do it. That's it exactly, and it's it's all about I suppose little improvements and the the power of small improvements over time. So, you know, if it's getting active for an extra fifteen minutes, or even just dedicating an extra fifteen minutes to sleep throughout the, the course of the week, you know, those do uh, add up over time. So, if, if you know, using Whoop, you get an insight into where you have areas for improvement. Uh, I think you know, everyone wants to, to feel and perform and, uh, and and do slightly more and feel slightly better. Um, so. I suppose Whoop is, is a tool that just helps guide you as to, to where you have potential for improvement. I'm not going to lie, I definitely had uh, the All-Ireland final marked on the calendar as a, that's the end of me being able to say, ah, I've got plenty of time for this. So I'm definitely knuckling down this week to train properly for our duathlon. Uh, how are the rest of um, Team OTB well, getting you, on? You've Go got on. you've got good news, Jer. Do I? I think Ronan's got I think Ronan's got good news about your uh, your possible training sessions today. Yeah, so Tommy and I were, were chatting, so we were looking, taking a quick look at the, the OTB Whoop team. And I think, Jerry, you're top of the class today at 90%, which means it's a great day for you to to go and push. So uh, no excuses today, whereas Tommy, after the tough win yesterday, uh, you know, was in the red. So today's the day for, for him to be kind to himself and, and take it easy and focus on recovery. That's not good news, Ronan. That means I have to go and do some work. <laughs> <laughs> you, have, you have something like 97% recovery, Jer. Like, what does that mean? You must that, have that got an unbelievable I, sleep last I, I night. I well you rested. Well rested. Yeah. This, is, this is the type of information that my wife's not supposed to know. Uh, so uh, tell us, how, does that, how, did you, how do you read that, Ronan? What is that, where does that come from? What's that, um, what does that figure actually mean? Yeah, so basically your your recovery score is derived off a couple of key health metrics. Um, so we're looking at heart rate variability, resting heart rate, sleep and respiratory rate. 
uh, basically we, we kind of pile them together to give you this daily recovery or readiness score. So simple enough, zero to 100%, red, yellow, green. Green means your body's in a great spot, you're primed to perform, you're good to go. So you, know, you for example, Jared, today have 90% recovery, which means you know, you know, know, today's the day to, to try and get a good session in. Um, you know, if you're in the, the yellow, you know, you've 50% recovery, whatever it is, you can still go and train, but it's just being mindful of where you're at and, and to not to absolutely um, smash it today or, or, or overdo it today. Um, whereas for you know, somebody who's in the red and their body is saying, look, if you're not 100% there, your body isn't primed to, to go and train. That's the day where you can focus on getting yourself right. So it's making sure that you're you know, looking after yourself today, getting adequate sleep that night. So then you're you're in a good position tomorrow to go and, and train or play or whatever it is that you're looking to do. So there's a nap on your schedule today, Tommy. Is that it? Oh, I don't know, Jared. I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna need to see. I'm gonna need protein shakes. I'm gonna need whatever I can. I'm on 28. percent I don't know how it's that bad. I, it's definitely sleep is is letting me down. So, um, Ronan thought I was on the beer yesterday when he saw how poor my recovery was, but I wasn't. It was a three hour drive back down to Clare. Uh, and so, how quickly will somebody like Tommy get back into the the green? And and how how can he use the information to try and get himself back into the green, Ronan? Yes, so there's no reason why Tommy can't have a, a great day tomorrow. So it's all about what he does today and, and making sure you look after yourself today so you're in a good spot tomorrow. So as Tommy said, you know, exactly the, the right things to do, focusing on his nutrition and his hydration. Uh, you know, if he can get to the sea, that's brilliant. We know that has a, a positive impact um, in terms of, of recovery. And what Tommy can do is he can actually track what he's doing. So the feature called the journal where Tommy can select whether he, you know, did an ice bath, whether he, you know, had uh, enough protein today, whether he went and he had uh, cryotherapy, which I'm not sure they have uh, down in, in Clare. Oh, they do. Absolutely. Uh, um, but all these things that, that might have an impact on Tommy can track it and then we'll actually tell him whether it works for him or it doesn't because all these things uh, and modalities are completely personalised. So what might work for Tommy might necessarily work for me. So being able to have insights into um, what are the, the actual factors um, that will impact your, your recovery uh, it, it just gives you uh, more of a guide as, as you go forward. Okay. And uh, I was saying, I know that a lot of the American footballers are using it, a lot of the NBA players are using it. It's obviously become really popular in, in GAA over the last 12 months as well. Yeah, big time. Uh, and you know, we were, we were obviously uh, keeping a keen eye, a keen eye out uh, over the weekend and, and actually saw Port Hampsey lift the Sam McGuire with a whoop on his wrist, which was, uh, you know, pretty nice, uh, pretty nice endorsement for us that we, we didn't necessarily expect. Um, but yeah, for sure, starting to see it pick, pick up more in the GAA with, you know, I suppose demands being put on players, you know, ever increasing. You know, there is that need to have insight into to what they're doing out off the pitch and, and outside of the, you know, the dressing room so that they, they can go in and perform at the highest level consistently. Essentially, it makes you mindful about the stuff that you're doing and then you can track back and, and have a record of, well, when I did this, I can see that it had this impact on my body. It, that's it, exactly. Uh, you know, I think it, a lot of folks tend to be in the dark and it's, uh, you know, it, it can be that light to give you a guide, as I said, um, you know, in, in the right direction, whether it's you know, focusing on sleep for some or whether it's actually uh, training slightly more for others. Um, it just gives you an idea of, of where you are and what you have the capacity to do. And uh, ultimately, as I said, we, we all want to to be our best or the best version of ourselves. And, and it is a tool that you can help um, or, or use it to help understand where you're at and where you have areas for improvement. Okay. Uh, so, we, 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 so we're getting down to business, Tommy. Are you ready to go? Uh, I'm going to take it easy today, Jerry, get my recovery right. And then I'm going to be going for the that duathlon and get myself ready for that. So, yeah. I expect Best you of luck to, today. I I'm looking forward to seeing your recovery tomorrow. I expect you to win, Tommy. That's that's what I'm hearing here from the, the point where you, you've reached high levels. So that you're at, you've actually put your body under proper strain to the point where, you know, at some point you're in the yellow. I mean, if I ever get to the yellow, I'd be pretty impressed. So we'll see. <laughs> Ronan, good stuff. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. Cheers. Thanks, lad. Sure, Ronan, Ronan Jones of Whoop there. Uh, part of our journey to uh, doing the duathlon. It's about three and a half weeks away now. I think it's um, Sunday, uh, one of the early Sundays in October anyway. 9.48 this morning here on OTBA and brought to you by Gillette. Good morning. Start with Gillette. Put your best face forward with their new and improved razors. Tomorrow, we're talking the fallout from the All-Ireland Football Final. We feature interview of Paul O'Connell and Champions League coming your way as well. We'll see you then. Sarah, the dust has settled at Crow Park. Let's get it out of the way. Goal, we have ground it out. I'm actually incredibly disappointed. I really thought this Cork team was going to do this today. But Galway were here last December. They were here in June. They obviously had a lot of hurt bottled and it showed when Cork got the goal. 
the best team after that was Galway. They outscored Gal Cork 1-4 to 1. That was the thing really, wasn't it? It looked like it felt like when Cork got that goal, the first time in the lead, huge roars. It was a vocal Cork crowd, as it always is. And you felt like, I think I'd even said to you a couple of minutes before, and Cork tied his turn. But they weren't able to convert it. Galway dug in and, I suppose, held out. Yeah, and look, I suppose what you're looking for, your team at that point, is your midfield to start winning primary possession. And I felt Ashling Thompson was out of the game at that just at that point after the goal. Chloe Sigerson, we didn't see her after that great point in the first half. There was probably too many players absent for Cork. Orla Cronin, despite the week, despite all the pressure, was outstanding for Cork today, but it just wasn't enough. I think Galway were full value for that win, and Aoife Donoghue, I know, got player of the match for RTE. She was everywhere, absolutely everywhere. I suppose shout out to Hannah Looney for Cork, who, who did an incredible job, and that block for you know, a potential Galway goal. That could have seen Galway over the line much, much earlier, but their resilience late on, so, so positive. And Orla McGrath had been quiet to the last 10 minutes and then pops up with these two outrageous late points. And I suppose if we rewind it back and look at the team selection, it was a hugely dramatic week off the pitch in terms of the suspensions, DRA, appeals. We didn't know until late last night. That surely, at the same time, I know the Cork management team will say, no, we're totally professional, but it still has to have a bit of an impact, surely on the team with that uncertainty. It had an impact on the team, but not on Orla, I suppose. You know, she was the one with the most pressure on her shoulders coming into it. I was disappointed that Linda Collins was dropped for Orla today. I thought there was room for both of them on the team. And that was obvious when Linda came on as captain. She got down to business. She got Katrina Mackey through for that great goal. She was on everything in, in that 20 minutes that was positive for Cork. And I, I just think maybe Poddy missed a beat because if he had played both Orla and Linda, they could have been further ahead earlier on. First half as well, it felt like Galway pretty much scored, I think they almost did score every opportunity but they were far more clinical, they probably not hung in the game but were a bit more maybe streetwise is the word. They were efficient but I did feel like Cork were on far more possession, they were much better in the ruck, they were clean, they were very clean in, in the way they were moving through the game so it was disappointing for Cork to go in at half time, one point down but that was down again to the player of the match Aoife Donoghue, she got that outrageous point from under the, under the stand, you know those are clutch moments and Galway had those clutch moments today Cork didn't have enough of those clutch moments today I think another, another thing we touched on at half time was the poke out situation in fact both sides almost were quite wasteful indicative really at what times was not scrappy but every it was so physical every the referee let it a lot go in terms of I suppose the spectacle if you want to call it that every ball was so hard for, it felt like at times there should have been more frees given we were wincing at times up here in the press box but the puck outs kind of situation probably again reflective of that kind of scrappy nature of the game there was very few balls won cleanly uh, I think Cork only won four clean balls Galway two there was a lot of balls being won on the break but fundamentally you're looking for your say full forward line half forward line to, to win possession but because the Galway backs in particular were so physical played so on the edge Cork didn't necessarily get the freeze that in other games that would be nailed on and that would have obviously brought them much much closer Amy O'Connor took a lot of punishment inside there from Shauna Healy Shauna Healy did her job it's the referee's job to obviously you know discipline players when she feels they're being too hard or, or going in too late or you know are too physical and she was letting a lot of it go so I wonder will Amy come off the field feeling a little aggrieved that she didn't have any protection he certainly had to earn for every ball out there at times, wasn't it? Yeah, and look, you know, it, it was going both sides. And as you said, we were wincing, but it did make for a spectacle. But sometimes it's important to recognise that you can't allow the backs to have free reign because the forwards were working so hard. You have to give them recognition where it's due. If they win the ball and they try to carry the ball and they're getting fouled, you have to give a free. Yeah, at times it meant, as you said, kind of set it up one way. And I'm not sure, did, did that suit Galway a little bit more than, than Cork, perhaps? I, I think it did. I suppose what we saw at the start of the second half was Galway setting up with three inside and then vast amount of space in front of them. The Galway forwards love that space. Siobhan McGrath loves the space. Aida Shirelli loves the space. Orla McGrath evidently loves the space. The Cork backs hate that space and it just seemed like it was a little bit more congested up the other end Sarah Durvin Shauna Healy Siobhan Gardner Emma Hellebert they were all buzzing around the Cork players there was very little space and crucially for me Cork instead of breaking the tackle were trying to hand pass the ball over players heads and there was some incredible in interceptions Dervla Higgins had two there was just key moments when you went this is the last pass it should be through tried to play it over players head and Galway were just 
coming through, interception, batting the ball through, coming away with the ball. And I suppose that's the most deflating thing from a Cork point of view, is that they were, look, they were looking that they were going to be on for a score. Score didn't materialise. I suppose to follow on from that then as well, there was a couple of... I suppose we call them goal scoring opportunities where you were like one moment away from, oh, that's for through. I can count in my head three or four come to mind straight away. Again, those small little margins of the, the, where the dice rolls. Well, when the referee is allowing the game to go, that's when you take those opportunities and you run the ball into the next tackle because she was clearly allowing the players with momentum to carry the ball through. If it was me and I knew the referee was being that loose, I'd take that extra step, I'd go past the player, I'd either win a free or I would have given the ball cleanly to the next player through. I wouldn't have been giving up the ball so easily with the player between me and the goal. Have I become too firm or too kind of over the top in the fact that maybe Galway read the game conditions slightly better? I think so. And look, as I said, Cork haven't been back here since 2018. You know, yes, they were here for the semi-final, but not being here last December, not being here in June for the league final, Galway had some really, really clever passages of play today. They didn't panic. They knew how they were going to grind it out. And I suppose playing Kilkenny, the champions, in both games and those games going to the wire, that was the difference between Cork and Galway today. Cork haven't had that experience in the championship. And that's why late on today, Cork didn't necessarily have any answers when Galway started asking big questions of them. Because that was the thing, really. Once the hard goal came, I think we touched on it a little bit earlier, you felt like the tide was swinging. But it was Galway that kind of stood up uh, I know from speaking to Paddy, he was kind of a little bit disappointed. Maybe perhaps his team stood back a little bit, but Galway grabbed the, the answer. They rallied, grabbed the game by the scruff of the neck, really. The goal, a couple of late, huge, huge, not just points, but like long range points that kind of were kind of real kind of stabs in the back in terms of the momentum that they created. Yeah, and look, they took off Carrie Dolan. They had Ailish O'Reilly on the freeze uh, late on. Big brave call to take off your free taker who'd been doing very well. Ailish O'Reilly stepped up, put a free over the bar from, you know, the 45 out in the sideline. Very, very difficult score. That was very important. Neve Kilkenny got an outrageous score, a very, very important score. She went left, she went right, she went back, she went forward, she went up, she went down. She eventually found the space to get the ball over the bar. Those ended up being crucial scores. Cork, by comparison, didn't have enough players wanting to get on the ball, I felt. And they made some mistakes. You know, we, we saw that Cork were getting change when they were kind of delivering direct ball. And you had a couple of great breaks from Amy O'Connor, Katrina Mackey. If it was me and I was the halfback, the likes of Laura Hayes, I wouldn't have been trying to go for my own score late on. I'd have been giving a direct ball into the girls. And because the game was so close, trying to win the free to bring it back and bring it back and bring it back. Was, uh, the, to a certain extent, you don't want to cross sports and compare sports, but there's a small element of maybe the Throne versus Kem Kerry semi-final in the fact that a bit of streetwise, don't be taken into contact. They felt like there was opportunities. The few times Cork did kind of spread it, go direct and wide. Again, these are for not any consolation to you or anyone else from Cork right now, but they're, the, I suppose, the next stepping stones, really, in trying to get that performance levels increased. Yeah, and I, and I wonder, were Cork too focused on goals? Because... The Antrim game previous to that, Maeve Kelly, the player of the match in that game, she got some great scores because she went into space and she took her chances from 40, 50 yards. Cork are capable of doing that, but they weren't looking to get into those spaces today. They were looking to go a very direct route. And when you say Sarah Durbin standing on at full back, you're not going to get in there easily. So I think there was a bit of naivety there. There was space. And if you think back to last year's All-Ireland final when Denise Gall was so prevalent for Kilkenny, where was she getting her scores? In that lovely space, out in the wing. Cork didn't do that today. Yeah, because it's like, again, I'm getting flashbacks to the first half. After a promising opening, say, quarter from Galway, it was Cork that kind of ground into the game, but it was kind of long-range points from there as well. I think at one stage, all their scores were from play, but they were all kind of from distance as well. Just didn't do enough of that as the game went on. Exactly. So I feel that if they had stuck to that process and sprayed the ball around the field, they would have got more change. But it just... It felt to me that they weren't looking for Chloe Sigerson, they weren't looking for Hannah Looney, Ashing Thompson. It they needed to drive, I suppose they needed to drive forward a little more, but they did need to bring out the kind of expanse of the game. They weren't they were they were playing it too narrow, too narrow, too direct. And ultimately I suppose it fell into Galway's hands. But at the same time, the character levels that they shown once that goal went on and, and something on, that's probably a lot of experience as well that you've touched on there as well. Certainly helps. And look, we'll, we'll talk about a bit of cynicism there later on. I was wondering how long it would take you to get this in. Look, it, it's exactly what I do. You know, uh, Aoife who went down around 56 minutes. 
with Galway were up by two. Um, another, I, I think they brought on three substitutes, Rebecca Henley, Noreen Cohn, Anne-Marie Starr. Just that bit of cuteness to run down the clock, Cork start to panic, then they're actually forcing it. They're not actually getting clean ball into the forwards. Then you just start running down the clock as Galway and that's probably the difference between the two teams. Cork were just a little naive today. When they went on top, they should have been able to set up and organise themselves so that they didn't allow Galway to win possession and they did the exact opposite. I suppose we, today we saw Galway kind of learn their lessons from last year and push on. You're open for something similar from Cork, definitely with your uh, red tinted glasses. Well, look, I'm disappointed to say that Hannah Looney, you know, is going to be away next year. Linda Collins is, is heading away next year. These are players that will be hard replaced. We didn't have a bench today. That was evident. We didn't. We brought on, I think, Kleena Healy um, and we brought on Linda Collins. But... I remember of, of old, we had five players to bring on to Cork teams when, when we were winning. And I think that's what Cork will have to do. They will actually have to give their players who are coming into the team more game time, more championship time. We don't see that through the championship. Paddy is notorious for not using subs. He's always played with 16 or 17 players. And unfortunately today, that proved the difference because I just felt that bit of experience when Rebecca Henley came in, Noreen Cohen, Amory Star. You, you can't buy that. I think the only last thing to do is maybe see if there's any ice because it was getting a bit intense there at times as the game was going on in the press box here. Well, I'm going to check your arm as well because I think you have a couple of bruises. I, I tend to, to mark the reporter like a fullback. So, look, I, I suppose I really enjoyed the game today because I thought it was a spectacle. After last Sunday, after Meath, I was going, how is the Camogie going to live up to that ferociousness that, that both teams showed last week? I think they did. Um, it's a different game. Right, but it but it is a brilliant game, and two teams went out there today and left everything on the field. I'm not disappointed in Cork. I'm disappointed for Cork because they did so many things right. They just did a couple of things wrong, and that proved the difference. Well, I think we're about to get kicked out of Crow Park here as well. We're the last one standing. Galway ultimately have done enough here full time at Crow Park. Sarah Durbin, she's going to get married in November. They're going to have right crack at that wedding in November. Uh, Captain, fantastic today. OTB AM with Gillette. Put your best face forward.